I made it go sideways. <laughs> My phone won't let me acknowledge. Okay. Good evening. Are we recording? We have people in on the waiting room? Yes, we're recording and people have been let in. Terrific. I am calling uh, the April 2022 meeting of the Transportation Advisory Board for the City of Boulder to order. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. We are going to uh, move right into the approval of the March 2022 minutes before um, we welcome our new members. Uh, new members, since you weren't here last time, we are, it's just going to be a, a small vote among the, the members here who, um, who were here at the last meeting. I did note that I have sent some small corrections. Uh, to our secretary, um, I'm forgetting <laughs> exactly what they were. <laughs> uh, I know that I changed um, a word from um, insufficient to deficient when we were discussing one of the tab, uh, the TIP grant um, opportunities. Oh, sorry, we should do the, the rules first, shouldn't we? I'm a little scattered this evening, sorry. Um, let me just state these since I've already started on this, the changes for the, for the, uh, for the minutes. Um, so to let other members kind of talk about them and then we will do our rules and regulations about online meetings and then we'll move to approval of the minutes. Um, uh, insufficient to deficient. Um, there was a transit on demand that should have been transit oriented um, design when we were discussing um, elements with the planning board. And then there was a third minor, you know, and that, that kind of typo related. Meredith, can you remind me what that third one was? Yes, I'm coming down to it. This is supposed to be displaying, but. It is, yes, you were doing it. Oh, okay. It's uh, this one, um, not a backup curve. Oh, a backup back curve instead of a backup curve. curve. Yes, so those, those minor revisions. So I will let that percolate. Well, I back up again. I need to write this stuff down for myself. <laughs> I mess this up every time. But uh, Veronica Sun is going to um, be our technical host for the evening. And I would like to turn it over to her at, for the moment to remind everyone. Uh, I think we are mostly old hats at this, but there are a few new names I see uh, joining. And so just to remind us how we are going to um, be operating this meeting this evening uh, in our virtual platform. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Well, thanks, Tila. Um, hello, my name is Veronica Sun, and I'll be your technical host for tonight. Thank you all for joining, and I will be reading a few housekeeping roles. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the City of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meetings are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions will be limited to three minutes. No person shall speak except when recognized by myself, and no person shall speak for longer than the given three minutes. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using their real name. Any person believed to be using a name other than the one they are commonly known by will not, permit, will not be permitted to speak at the meeting. Uh, if you are on the phone, uh, you need to press star six to unmute and star nine to raise your hand. And then no video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers. All others will participate by voice only. I will be enforcing these rules by muting anyone who violates them. And the chat functions enable for tonight's meeting and it will be used for uh, individuals to communicate with myself. Uh, it should be used for technical and online platform related questions only. If an if an attendee attempts to use the chat for any other reason, the city reserves the right to disable the individual's access to the chat. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screens. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Sorry, I skipped over you. <laughs> it's okay. All right, um, with that, I will turn back to uh, a consideration of the minutes from the last meeting. Um, Ryan and Alex, do you have any further, any objections to the corrections that I have um, requested or any further corrections in our amendments to the draft? Alex, you've unmuted. 
no, I'll move that we uh, move to amend to approve the minutes as amended. Second. Thank you, Ryan. Um, all in favor? Minutes are approved. Thank you very much. Um, next on our agenda is um, recognizing and introducing our new tab members. Um, however, I am going to pause here uh, as we unfortunately have to do with um, some regularity to recognize, I think, um, frankly, a more important order of business, which is uh, over the past several days, we have had another series of um, uh, high injury and a fatal crash. Uh, we've had at least three, four members of uh, the community um, injured and another killed um, in two separate incidents in the last few days, uh, at various intersections on uh, Foothills Highway. Um, as usual, we don't have very many details at this point. Um, police investigation continues. I've of course been vocal about that. I would like to, to learn more as um, events proceed, but uh, I continue to struggle to make sure that our community doesn't treat these as statistics and numbers and something to be crunched um, in an annual report or a biannual report, but to note every time that our transportation system is failing real human beings and injuring real human beings. Um, we will, of course, later on this evening hear from staff about their plans uh, on the port arterial network um, to address some of the more dangerous roadways that we have, but nevertheless, um, we're at another uncomfortable juncture where members of our community are suffering, injured, and dead because of issues with our transportation network and our failures to keep them safe. And um, when I can, I, I name names. I, I have no names to share with you this evening, but I did want to note at the top of our meeting because it is the most important thing that we do to ensure the safety of our fellow citizens and residents and visitors and everyone out on our roadways. Thank you, Erica, for keeping us um, informed and apprised as you can. Um, you know, I know that you take this seriously, you know that I take this seriously, and I would at this point reiterate my request um, at the last two meetings to have the police department come and interact with us more frequently because um, these incidents are distressingly frequent and need to be more top of mind, I think, for all city agencies. Kayla, if I Yes, may. Erica. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to have the chair recognize me, so thank you. Thank you. Um, so just to, I guess, um, reiterate what you said, we too at a staff level are saddened by these crashes and the injuries and the death and it's certainly not anything that we would ever want to have to share not only with you but with the community and um, I think that you know we strive very hard to be able to as all of us do here in this virtual room and beyond to um, strive to reach our vision zero goal and so whenever that goal is not attained it truly impacts um, us also from the heart with regard to your um, question about the um, police um, mm -hmm. providing a report and so forth, um, I believe I want to say it's like in the um, June um, tab meeting that we have tentatively, you know, are looking to schedule. But I will confirm that um, with the, the um, folks in the, um, in, in the PD. They've recent had recently had some changeover um, in their key staff um, in this arena, so. Um, we're working on that together. So just wanted to let you know, we are being responsive as an entire um, city organization. Thank you, Eric, I appreciate that. Do any other members of TAP wanna weigh in on this at this moment? I think this is a, another frequent reminder of arterials are, are killing our, mm -hmm. our community. And when we look at where we've started with our TMP goals and how far we have to go, we're, we're closer to square one than the finish line. And so as we, we bring on some new members and for those of us who've been around for a while, we, it's a reminder that we have so much work yet to do. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, Vision Zero has eluded us for this year. 
All right. Well, on that somber note, I mean, <laughs> I didn't mean to make it a bummer for you, but uh, it is important. It's important to note. And uh, I think that we are in agreement that it needs to be noted sort of at the top of the meeting because it should be at the top of what we think about and what we do. Turning now to our new members, I would really like to uh, welcome Trini Willerton and Rebecca Davies to the board. I am going to turn it over to our secretary, <laughs> Meredith Schleske, to um, swear in, administer the oath and swear in our new members. Well, thank you, Tito. Um, I believe each are ready to read their oath into the record. And Trini, if you want to go ahead, and I think Veronica will display that for everyone to see. Um, you're muted, Trini. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, so yes, I will begin. Um, I, Maria Trini Willerton, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the state of Colorado and the charter and ordinances of the city of Boulder and faithfully perform the duties of the office of a member of, trans of the Transportation Advisory Board, which I am about to enter. Thank you. Thank you. And yours will be up shortly here, Rebecca. Alex put his hand up. Did you want to comment, Alex? Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. It was the clap icon. Oh, it was a clap icon. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, should I go ahead? Sure, thank you. Okay. Um, I, Rebecca Davies, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and of the state of Colorado and the charter and ordinances of the city of Boulder and faithfully perform the duties of the office of a member of the Transportation Advisory Board, which I am about to enter. Thank you. Thank you. Well done and welcome, you two. It's a pleasure to have you aboard. I, I saw Ryan do the literal clap emoji earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but we're very pleased to have you aboard. All right. So now that we have five uh, people seated and uh, two new members, we should move on to the election of officers and, uh, and shuffle the officer deck. Um, I was busy today and forgot to look up my protocol, but <laughs> uh, I believe what we will be doing is uh, accepting nominations for um, the office of chair first and then vice chair and then secretary. Uh, all, any, any member of the board is able to nominate uh, any person, but let us start with nominations for, uh, for chair for this next year, for the 2022 to 2023 year. Um, Ryan, have your hand up. Uh, Teela, I would like to nominate uh, my colleague, Mr. Alex Weinheimer for uh, chair. And this is where I was supposed to do my homework. Um, if, if a second is uh, required, I second that nomination. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have a nomination for Alex Weinhammer for chair. Are there any further nominations? I'd like to nominate Ryan for chair. Trini Willerton nominates Ryan for chair. Is there a second? The nomination fails. <laughs> <laughs> Any further nominations for chair? Way to read the tea leaves. Well done. Uh, shall we proceed with a vote <laughs> for chair for the Transportation Advisory Board for 2022 to 2023? All in favor of Alex Weinheimer as chair, please raise your hand virtually or on your screen. I see five yays. The yays have it, Alex. Yay, you're the new chair. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you. Um, here's the second time I'm like, oh, I should have looked this up. Should I continue? <laughs> or would you like to, Alex to take over <laughs> with the rest of the elections? Alex, yeah, no. Meredith, yes, do you have any guidance for us? I would say that Alex can assume chairing the rest. Excellent, well done. Alex, assume chairmanship, sir. 
Thanks, Tila, for Thank you. Us the last two years. I will open up for nominations the position of vice chair. I would like to nominate Ryan Schuhard for vice chair. I second the nomination. Any others? Okay, Ryan for vice chair, show of hands. It's unanimous, five votes. Congrats, Ryan. And finally, our board secretary. And I'll open that for nominations and I'll, I'll hop in here and, and nominate uh, Meredith Schleski to continue on in the, the capacity that she has for as long as I've been around and done a fantastic job. I'll second that sooner than she can decline. <laughs> <laughs> All of those in favor that Meredith be our secretary. Uh, another unanimous five zero zero vote. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, we'll move to public comment now where members of the public will be able to speak for up to three minutes on any transportation topic. Later this evening, we'll be discussing uh, the Pine Street and Whittier NSMP project. If you're here to speak about the Neighborhood Speed Management Program project, we'll hold a public hearing specifically for that um, after public comment. So public comment, again, just, just folks talking about things other than the um, complex NSMP project. So with that, uh, use the raise hand feature if you're interested in speaking during public comment and someone from the city will pull up the timer to facilitate that. Let's see Veronica's here. Yes, I am here now. Okay, awesome. Just a reminder, you need to have your first and last name to be able to speak. Um, it looks like Lynn is gonna be the first one to speak today. I'm gonna unmute you and then add the three minute timer, so. I want my video, I want my video, my video, my video, my video, my video. They do it in Denver, that the capital, they can, we can do it in Boulder, we can do it. Yes, yes, Alex, so glad you're the chair. Rocks, better than president of the United States, you're president of TAB, you rock, yay. So good, I can't believe my good fortune. Um, however, what we need to do that's preventative is stop CU South. And you need to have a say on what this is going to do to your budget if we go for CU South. Um, I'm also finding, I can't remember last because I ride all over. I saw Tila on the bridge the other day after the conference on world's affairs, but there are impediments. And I keep on running into construction impediments for one thing. So <laughs> that's another problem of, you know, and, and that's gonna hurt some people. Um, for example, I have to go on the opposite side where that um, your place burned down and I don't know if they're ever gonna tell us what caused that fire. It's like the Marshall fire, we might find out in 10 years, you know, it's pretty obvious it's the coal scenes. But in any case, we need to have you know, standard potholes dealt with. And this is not, it, it's just not feasible with the kind of growth that we're experiencing in the, in the, in the wealth. Of the and that's the thing that drives the transportation back down so much is um, people have to go further and further to the open space because they're out on the plains um, where it's a thousand dollars a square foot commercial and flat out business calls, you know, and they're just driving in and out of Boulder and increasing the congestion here. So we need to follow what the blue line folks said and keep this place small, not up, 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 bigger, wider, taller, and all of that. Um, and, and we need this, you know, per capita impact fee, in, basically an impact fee for every development that happens here because you are the board that gets affected directly with this. And, you know, and I ride my bike, I drive my car twice a year, you know, so I appreciate that. 
but um, but I need some support on my bike to get around town, to not have trails just ending suddenly because they narrowed down to nothing, you know, like on, in South Boulder when I'm going down to examine the Marshall Fire. And boy, suddenly my, my trail's gone and I have to cross two highway on my bike, um, you know, the South Boulder Road. Thanks, bye. Thanks, Lynn. It looks like Michelle Boyd has expressed interest in the chat that she would like to speak. Would it be possible to unmute her? Hi guys, um, thanks for letting me chat for a minute. Um, I have been in Boulder for 25 years and um, we moved out to the county from the city and learned out about all the problems that they have with the roads out there in unincorporated Boulder County. But what I'm really surprised about and the reason I wanted to come on this call today is that I'm really not sure why our roads are such a disaster compared to every town around us. Like, I don't understand. And is it this board's responsibility? Is there somebody else I need to talk to? Is it like, who does this responsibility fall on? Because I get it in the county. That's a whole other myriad of a mess of an issue that I fully understand because I'm very involved in that initiative. But I do not understand it at all in the city when like Mohawk Drive, a major artery off baseline, literally like you need a four wheel drive to get down that road um, out by um, Crestview. Like I, I don't even understand what's going on with the major arteries surrounding our public schools. And I don't understand why they look so terrible within the city limits. Like I don't, I just, I've lived here for so long and just dealt with it, moved out to the county and thought maybe it would get better and then learned out all about all those issues. And I'm considering moving back into the city because of strictly the roads issues that are present in the county and for homeowners, like who will never have their roads repaved ever again. It's a huge issue for our home values. So I came into the city hoping this would change. And I guess I'd just like to hear from you. And I don't know if you respond to co public comment because I don't have a whole lot else to say with my three minutes, but I just, am, I don't know if you respond to public comment, but I, I don't know how to just get that question answered because I still don't understand after having lived here for 20 years, why our roads compared to Louisville, Broomfield, Erie, all of these rounds, uh, towns around us that have so much more money, roads look their roads look amazing <laughs> and ours just look terrible so i guess i just don't understand as a citizen who hasn't been involved with the city roads at all um and i'd love to to understand that more and get involved if there's anything we can do i, I just don't know but it feels very paralyzing when you drive around on roads that feel like you need a four-wheel drive to around drive around our city roads and then at the same time you see massive amounts of money pouring in in the form of sales tax to 29th street and commercial developments and you kind of wonder where that money is going and why it isn't going into our internal infrastructure and road system so thanks michelle it sounded like there were some questions in there. Would anyone from staff like to address them? Just very briefly that um, you know, as we go through and you know provide highlights um, and briefings to TAB, we can certainly you know talk about our pavement management condition and um, the factors that go into it, as well as the funding um, and the gap between the two. So um, at a future date, we'd be very happy to respond. Thanks, Erica. I think, Michelle, we all bear some responsibility for it. We've linked our transportation spending with our sales tax, which is reducing and the cost of construction is increasing. And so it's for us to improve the quality of our, our roads, we'll need to work with, with council to create a, a new funding mechanism to, if we want to maintain roads at a, at a higher standard. Alex, can I, can I say something? Yep. Just wanted to acknowledge Michelle and say thanks. We we do hear you. We're listening. So I'm, I'm a member of TAB, um, and you know I I ask this question sort of sometimes rhetorically about multimodal infrastructure and how is it we're such a wealthy city and we can't get you know a grid of protected bikeways. Um, and I so it's something that it's a the the question of resources and what explains the gap in such a wealthy place that um, I'm also very interested in and. Um, 
need to do further work myself on. Um, and anyway, I just want to say appreciate hear you and appreciate the, the question and would be willing to stay further engaged on this. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, funding is something that we, we often talk about and, and, and hope to increase that pool of money sooner than later. Is there anyone else interested in speaking at the public hearing or will it be time to move on to our first agenda item? I'm not seeing any hands. So next up, we will have a public hearing on the neighborhood speed management program complex project in the Whittier neighborhood, which includes Pine Street. Uh, we will begin with a presentation from staff where hopefully they provide a good amount of background information and answer some of the questions that people might have. Then members of the board will be able to ask clarifying questions. We'll then open things up to a public hearing where members of the public will have up to three minutes to provide input on this project. And then Tab will move on to our deliberation. So I see a presentation has popped up. So I assume someone from staff is, is ready to go. Yes, ready to go. Welcome, Nathan. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, um, and good evening. My name is Nathan Pope. I'm a new senior transportation planner with Transportation and Mobility, and I'm here to present on the Whittier Complex Neighborhood Speed Management Program project. Um, the intent of bringing this project to TAB this evening is to solicit feedback and finalize the design for the project so that it is ready once funds to construct the project become available. Um, as we do have some new faces, um, uh, a a quick reminder that the Neighborhood Speed Management Program, also known as the NSMP, um, was established back in 2017 to address speeding issues on local and collector neighborhood streets. The purpose of the NSMP is to support the community safety and neighborhood livability goals, as outlined in the Transportation Master Plan. The program also supports Boulder's Vision Zero goals by proactively reducing the risk of severe crashes and improving bicycle and pedestrian comfort through, the redu through reducing vehicle speeds on neighborhood streets. The Whittier Neighborhood Speed Management Program project that we are looking at this evening combines three streets, Mapleton, Pine, and Spruce, between each between 20th and 28th Street, as you can see on this map. This map was, we'll be referencing throughout the presentation. Um, and then going into the project timeline, this was the top project in the 2019 NSMP project cycle and was prioritized for planning in 2021 and installation in 2022. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent impacts to the department's budget, the project was postponed. Staff did initiate the project in the summer of 2021 with a corridor analysis and two public open houses. The third and final public open house was held last month to present the concept design to the community and collect feedback. Today, we're bringing that concept design to tab for a public hearing and recommendation. The detailed design and construction phase of the project are on indefinite hold as the NSMP resources and funding are repurposed on council direction to focus on arterial streets and the CAN, which you'll hear about in the next presentation. So for this project, we began by collecting data and conducting analysis of crashes, traffic speed, and traffic volumes. We then engage neighborhood residents to understand the local issues and the concerns and to collect community preferences on different design treatments. We then created a concept design where we matched those proposed design treatments to the identified problems. Through our data collection, we saw a significant number of speeding vehicles on each street. This map shows the percentage of vehicles speeding on each street um, with Mapleton and Spruce having a speed limit of 20 miles per hour and Pine Street there in the middle having a speed limit of 25 miles per hour. We also looked at crashes. Thankfully, there was no known fatalities in the five years of data we looked at, but there were some severe injuries, and those were particularly located at the intersections. With this data in hand, we held our first community event in the Whittier Schoolyard in August 2021, where we reviewed the existing conditions and discussed traffic safety issues in the neighborhood. A second neighborhood meeting was held virtually in December 21, 2021 to review traffic calming options based on stakeholder and community engagement, where we asked residents for feedback on the potential options in different locations. We asked community members about several traffic calming treatments, including speed humps and speed cushions, traffic circles of aprons, raised intersections, pedestrian refuge islands, curb extensions, and high visibility crosswalks. And across these items, we found broad support for each of these traffic calming treatments. So that all brought us to the design concept. And so um, with consultant support, we began development of the Whittier Complex Project uh, recommended design concept. And that's what I'll be sharing with you um, for the rest of this presentation. 
So here we're going to go over a high level overview of the design concept and the, the details can be found in your attachments. I'm going to start at Mapleton um, and then go down to Pine and then Spruce. Starting with uh, Mapleton at the top of your screen and going west to east, we started with an existing speed hump um, here between 21st and 22nd. Then further east, the concept design adds an apron to the existing traffic circle at 23rd Street and two new speed humps um, between 24th and Folsom and between 26th and 27th. The concept design also includes, um, also includes a new hardened center line at Folsom to prevent illegal left turns onto Folsom and to slow down turning vehicles entering the neighborhood. Moving down to Pine Street, the concept design has four new speed cushions at 22nd, 23rd, 26th, and 27th, plus a new apron added to the existing traffic circle at 23rd Street. At Whittier Elementary, we are proposing to add an additional pedestrian refuge island um, to the west side of this 21st Street intersection. The concept design also recommends two new pedestrian refuge islands at 26th Street. The low stress uh, bike network plan recommends that the buffered bike lanes on Pine Street east of Folsom be extended to the west. The new two foot buffer on this section will be added, will also help to narrow the travel lanes and can be added without impacting on street parking. Moving down to Spruce Street, the design concept recommends two new speed cushions on either side of 23rd Street. It also sharpens the tapers at the existing refuge islands on 21st Street to create the visual narrowing of the road and expectations of slower speeds. We only looked at the west section of uh, Spruce Street as we anticipate street reconstruction with a new development project plan for the east section of Spruce. The total cost of this design concept is approximately $270,000. Overall, this design reflects comments and polling responses from the second neighborhood meeting, an online comment form, and emergency response and maintenance clearance requirements. The idea is to have regular traffic calming features along each corridor, so every several hundred feet, people uh, driving encounter a traffic calming feature that reinforces that they should be driving at low and even speeds. The concept design was presented to the community at a third and final virtual neighborhood meeting on March 28th. The 15 participants who attended were informed of the project background and then reviewed the concept design, providing feedback through an online poll. Generally, participants felt positive about the design concept with 80 to 93% responding that they liked or strongly liked the design for each street segment. A question and answer session was held uh, with key staff um, after the presentation. Partic participants voiced questions about the use of speed cushions versus speed humps and how the project would be maintained. Several participants also expressed frustration that the NSMP and the Whittier Complex project have been paused and were interested in alternatives to see the project through detailed design and construction. So looking forward, after bringing this design concept to TAB this evening, we're looking at several options to move the project towards construction. We're exploring working within planned scheduled maintenance to install certain components of the concept design, particularly the buffered bike lanes along Pine. Also, if and when the neighborhood speed management program restarts, this would be a top priority project. Quickly, I wanted to, uh, to mention um, two other NSMP projects that are not part of the Whittier project um, that are wrapping up construction on a final uh, and final components. We plan to install the permanent chicanes on Upland Avenue in the next month in a reconfigured uh, location slightly to the west to better allow um, driveway access for residents. And then on 26th Street, that project has uh, two final medians that we're going to be added um, as the last components of those streets and SMP projects shortly as well. So tonight, um, we are seeking a recommendation from TAB to finalize the recommended design of the Whittier NSMP complex project so that it can be implemented when funding is available. With that, I want to thank all the community members who are engaged with this project, and now I'd be happy to, to do my best to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nathan. So now we'll go on to questions from TAB. And I see Tila, you your hand up. Thanks, Alex. Um, I am wondering the same thing that Community Cycles was wondering earlier this week or last week. Um, why are there speed cushions instead of speed humps on spruce? Because our my understanding was the speed cushions were something that were um, put in on critical emergency response routes. And they said, and I didn't double check, that spruce in this section is not a CERR. Can you comment on that? Sure, um, just so everyone's on the same page, um, we have a speed cushion here on the left 
and a speed hump on the right. I have a couple of reference slides if we want to zoom into anything. Um, I think speed cushions function very similar to speed humps, um, but they have those cutouts that allow the emergency vehicles to pass their wheels on either side of that raised area. Um, I, you know, in conversations with the, the fire department, they requested that speed cushions for, for Spruce Street as well, um, even though it is not a designated emergency route. Um, the fire department regularly, regularly uses the street. Um, I think, you know, as we move forward with this project into, into detailed design, that's definitely something that we can revisit and have another conversation with the fire department and let them know that speed humps are, the, are preferred by community cycles. And we heard that from the community as well. So, sorry. So if we approve uh, this design, you're still saying there's still room to go back and revise it later? Is that what I just yes. heard? As we move from the concept design into the, the detailed design, we would have um, that option to, to move these from speed cushions to speed humps. Okay. Um, I guess my last question on speed cushions uh, was partly what, what the, that letter had alluded to was observing behavior of uh, motor vehicle drivers sort of diverting. Um, I know I, I, I drive occasionally in uh, Louisville and where they have speed cushions, the um, the profile is significantly different. This uh, what you're showing here on your screen is a much more eased and like a lengthy and sort of gradual thing. And in Louisville, those suckers mean business. <laughs> you really slow down. Um, so do you have any evidence on what flavor or profile of speed cushion um, diminishes that driver behavior versus exacerbates that driver behavior, or do you not have any information on that? I don't think we have any exact um, uh, information on, on kind of how the, the speed cushions um, affect drivers or if drivers are kind of circumnavigating them. I think it's definitely something that we're um, looking at. Um, I don't know. I saw Garrett pop, on my, uh, pop up on my screen. Garrett, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, there's we, we have some guidelines that we like to follow. Uh, for the record, uh, Garrett Slater, Principal Transportation Pro Projects Engineer. So we do have some guidelines uh, with respect to what we call, uh, I need to really find a layperson term for this, but the geek term for it is algebraic grade difference between the normal uh, grade of the road and the, the, and the grade that's on the hump of the, or, or, the, or the cushion. And that difference, uh, we have guidelines about um, what we like to follow in order to see meaningful speed reduction. And so um, it, it, sometimes though, it can be too abrupt uh, as we experienced uh, a few months ago when we implemented the 55th and 26th and the contractor uh, got the wrong message about the elevation. And so we had to go back and smooth them out. So, um, but uh, we do have general guidelines and we can get into more detail and follow up with you if you'd like to review that, Tila. Thank you very much, that's helpful. Um, I did ride the 55th Street heat speed humps earlier, I guess it was the end of last week and I, I think they're operating much better now. <laughs> Thanks, Tila. Any more questions from Tab? Yeah. Becky? Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, my question is just about the intersection of Folsom and Pine. It's the location with the most crashes and the most severe injuries, but it doesn't have any direct treatment. And I'm wondering if like why it doesn't have something or yeah, just kind of what, what the situation is given that that seems to be the most dangerous intersection in this area. Sure. Um, so I, I believe, and, and Garrett can jump in here, there's a separate project, uh, HZIP project, that's going to be recon reconstructing the signal at that intersection. And um, Folsom is also on the core arterial network um, as one of our uh, uh, primary corridors that we'll be looking at. So I, um, the, the main reason that we didn't do any interventions there is there's separate projects that will be looking at that intersection. Is that right, Garrett? Right. So the main line of Folsom we uh, addressed last year, but uh, the uh, specific intersection treatments, we were exploring some of those concepts, but the delayed on implementing them until the traffic signal is in installed, because some of those treatments would likely be disrupted with the installation. So once we are able to move forward with that project um, late this year and into next year, we would look at doing some of those other safety improvements as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's where my line of thinking went, where we have this location where the majority of the severe crashes are. And I've had some uh, offline conversations with some members of staff who have shared concepts for that location, which included a, a layout for a protected intersection 
is a protected intersection treatment at Folsom and Pine something that's still being considered as a part of the, the HDIP implementation? Yes, that's correct, Alex. Awesome. Any more questions from TAB before we open the public hearing? Seeing none. So now any members of the public that would like to provide input have up to three minutes to share their thoughts with us. And then after that, TAB will uh, proceed to our deliberation. Veronica, are you gonna? So if you're interested in speaking, uh, use the uh, reactions tool to raise your hand. And uh, Veronica, if you see any hands raised, uh, please start calling on people. Will do. I'm not seeing any yet though. Final call to speak at the public hearing. It looks like Lynn just raised her hand. So I'm gonna go ahead, ask her to unmute and start yeah, my three I missed, minutes. I missed part of this discussion, but it's around Whittier. Um, I wish I could interact with you because I'd give up some of my time, but I think you know how I'd probably stand. And it's probably the same stand as Alex would take about it. Um, I guess that these are the outlines of the ideas here on the, that I'm seeing on the screen. I'd support all of that. Um, yeah. Um, whatever protects the citizens most and preserves the, um, the resources of the Transportation Advisory Board, um, that's what I would go for. And um, yeah, anything slowing, uh, slowing traffic. Because um, uh, the, the most disturbing thing for me going around town is I, I do, I, probably avoid any places where there's a lot of traffic and a lot of you know uh, fast moving vehicles um that are that are just disturbing to my you know countenance Psychology. yeah psychologically and um so traffic slowing mechanisms would be great and um any anything else that you folks have proposed sounds good Sorry, I just had other things in the middle of this, but thanks. No worries. Thank you, Lynn. Anyone else interested in speaking during the public hearing? Not seeing any hands, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and begin our deliberation. Any TAB members have any thoughts on how we want to proceed in this stalled project? Tila? Tila, you're on mute, I think. Thank you. I hit unmute and it didn't take. I, I, it seems like the basic question is, does TAB sign off on this or not? Um, and it, to the extent that we might have some, you know, nitpicks on particular choices here, it doesn't much matter. <laughs> it sounds like if it ever gets funded, there's going to be another round of thinking about it uh, and like vetting the design work. And so it doesn't feel like a particularly good use of a, of a public hearing to me. Um, so I, I suppose it would be an appropriate time to just say, you know, are there any big picture objections to this other than putting it on the shelf versus proceeding with the quarter million dollar funding that is probably not gonna happen. <laughs> that kind of feels like the decision point that we are at. Um, I, I do have a, a couple of nitpicky feedback things, but I'm not sure it matters at this moment. Yeah, I don't see any reason to commit to anything too grand at this point. I would be interested if it was possible to implement the pavement markings that would create the buffered bike lanes on Pine. I feel like that would be a small mm -hmm. percentage of the quarter plus million dollar project. And, and with that, we could create a safer bicycling facility and, and also by narrowing the travel lanes, hopefully reduce speeds, which is the objective of, of this program. 
And then I would want to reassess the impacts of any investments we make on Folsom before we, this data was captured before we had modified Folsom and Pine. I think there's likely other improvements that we can do on Folsom for cars turning off of Folsom onto these, these side streets uh, south of Pine. And so I'd want to see what the data says after those uh, more cost-effective arterial focused improvements are installed um, before committing to, to anything else, just to see what impact, if at all, that has. So I think where I would land is, is not commit to anything right now, but see if staff thinks it's possible to implement the just the protect the buffered bike lanes rather uh, west of Folsom. Nathan, do you think that's something that could be done independent of the other uh, proposed treatments? Um, I, yes, I believe that is definitely something that the top thing that we would be able to explore um, through scheduled maintenance would be adding those uh, buffered bike lanes. And so I think that's a um, I don't want to guarantee it, but I think that's a, a the first thing that we would look at doing and seems pretty probable. Thanks. Any other members of TAB have any thoughts on how to proceed with this? Not seeing any, would anyone like to start crafting a motion? Okay, can I propose a motion? <laughs> I mean, it, we, we're just talking about putting something on the shelf, right? Or recommending that we, uh, in the near term, follow up through with the, um, the bike lanes installation because that costs relatively little. Yeah, and, well, he said that was going to be happening. Okay. Erica. Thank you. I, I, I think I just wanted to be able to express it's beyond just simply putting it on the shelf. I think that we wanted to also provide a level of surety and certainty for the um, neighborhood that um, so much work had gone into. And so um, you know, from a staff perspective, we were prepared to go ahead and implement this once, um, you know, the design had been finalized, but in the um, pivot and repurposing dollars from um, NSMP um, and other programs to the CAN, it doesn't, we don't have the funds to be able to do that, but we did want to at least acknowledge all the work that had gone into working with the stakeholders in the neighborhood. And so that was our intention in bringing this forward. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, I think we're all gracious for the effort that staff put into this. It was neat that they looked at an, an area, not just a single street. And of course, grat gratitude is, is owed to the neighbors who, who participated in the public process. I think looking at the, the cost of this for context, the, the half mile of protected bike lanes on the nearby arterial Folsom cost $100,000 less than these. Um, the set of proposed devices in the neighborhood. And so I would anticipate from a cost benefit perspective, that'll be a lot more um, effective. So um, it sounds like tab, I'm not hearing any objections to, we just don't commit to finalizing this design anytime soon, is that fair? I think that what staff is asking for is some kind of stamp of approval so they don't have to come back again if they want to. I wouldn't want to implement them it. should funding become available. I wouldn't want to approve anything until we see how the the interim treatments impact the speed and safety in this area. Okay. I, I'm kind of with you on that. So it sounds like no no formal recommendation from tab then. Agreed. Any you're not, you're fishing for emotion and you're not getting one. <laughs> there are no other thoughts we, we can move on. Um, we appreciate the work that's been done here. Uh, very, very thorough. But as we all know, limited resources to go around and, and 300 miles of roadways to try to fix. 
Okay, with that, we will move on to the staff briefing and tab feedback on the core arterial network and the upcoming pavement management program. Thank you, Nathan, for joining us. And I think now I'll pass it off to Valerie Watson. Thanks, Alex. Um, let me just get my, my settings here. All right. Um, good evening, Chair Weinheimer, Vice Chair Schuchert, and members of TAB. I'm Valerie Watson, Transportation Planning Division Manager with the City of Boulder. Presenting alongside me tonight is Garrett Slater, our Principal Transportation Engineer over Capital Projects. And let's start with the core arterial network followed by Garrett presenting on the pavement management program. I'd first like to recognize the role of TAB in what we are about to present tonight. As TAB vice chair and now chair, Alex Weinheimer has presented previously the concept of a core arterial network that started as a light bulb moment for him. Our busiest streets connect us to an array of day-to-day -day destinations and they're a critical piece of our overall mobility network. With one map, Alex found a way to articulate this concept visually, stitching together pieces of our existing policy documents to catalyze this conversation. And in February of this year, Boulder City Council elevated this concept as one of its 12 priorities for city departments, tasking transportation and mobility with generating a plan, a plan for the can. It's an ambitious vision, but as we will discuss tonight, it's also a vision that we share as planning and engineering professionals for the future of our city. And it reflects many of the projects and design approaches already identified in the 2019 transportation master plan. The CAN concept serves as a unifying force for city staff, elected officials, and the public. And tonight, we're pleased to present to you staff's efforts to advance this concept into a strategic work plan for the core arterial network that aligns city resources and members of the community to bring this vision to fruition. So first, let's talk a bit more about what the CAN is and what it is not. We agreed in an, the importance of a layered network of arterial streets. So some arterial streets should have modal priority and that's special emphasis on design elements that make it safer, more comfortable, more convenient to take the bus or ride a bike. And that sidewalks and crossings for people walking serve everyone, whether you're stepping out of your car to walk to a shop or getting off your bike to lock it up and catch the bus. We see the CAN as the next frontier for Boulder mobility. Building from the existing world-class network of on-street facilities, off-street multi-use paths, neighborhood streets, underpasses, and transit priority streets, we can close the gaps that exist in our overall network so that anyone can find a connected, consistent route to where they need to go, no matter how they get around. As you can see on this map, we have already made a lot of progress over the years implementing big projects on our big streets. And the beauty of the concept that city council has directed us to pursue is that it complements that work and focuses investment so that almost every corner of the city is within walking or biking distance of a network that will take you anywhere in the city and beyond. As we have articulated in the memo circulated to you all at TAB, we are advancing the concept of the CAN into a work plan. This work plan is shown in blue lines on the map. It's important to note that progress has already been made on building out infrastructure along our core arterial network overall, shown in dark gray on the map. And we continue to make progress every day with an ongoing suite of projects. Our work plan involves finding opportunities to accelerate remaining projects along this identified network through strategic reallocation of staff and funding resources. Let's also talk about what the CAN is not. The CAN is not just one project and it's not a plan that will sit on the shelf. Rather, it's an approach to maximizing and focusing our limited resources where they will have the most impact for Boulder and the planet. 
We should also note that the CAN concept prioritized by council and the corridors that are represented and in this work plan, they've all been identified previously in our strategic planning and policy documents. The 2019 transportation master plan identified both Folsom and Iris as streets for future corridor studies. And all of the corridors with a bicycle facility focus with the exception of Pearl Street were designated as candidates for protected bicycle lanes with vertical or horizontal separation in our 2019 low stress walk and bike network plan. 28th, Broadway, East Arapahoe, these are all corridors identified as candidates for bus rapid transit and other transit enhancements in the NAMS or the Northwest Area Mobility Study. And that's our regional transit plan with RTD and neighboring jurisdictions. Our Vision Zero Safe Streets Report and forthcoming Vision Zero Action Plan also address CAN work plan corridors. Starting with our transportation master plan is that overarching policy document and building from these other plans and efforts, the CAN work plan is the prioritization of the policy direction and project candidates that are found throughout these documents. And we'll work to implement the CAN through programs such as the Capital Improvement Program, Pavement Management Program, and Vision Zero. When it comes to designing and implementing projects along the CAN, and as our um, former tab chair, Tila, recognized at the opening of this tab meeting, there's a human cost to consider. The incidence of crashes resulting in serious or fatal injuries. The 2022 Vision Zero Boulder Safe Streets Report found that a majority or 67% of traffic crashes that result in serious injury or death occur on Boulder's arterial streets. And 44% of total citywide serious and fatal crashes occur along streets identified in the CAN work plan, those streets shown in blue on the map. What's good is that the forthcoming Vision Zero Action Plan will have a strong focus on the CAN work plan corridors, allowing us to integrate crash analysis and countermeasure pairing into the overall project development process. We also know that focusing investments along the corridors in the CAN work plan reaches a fair portion of the overall Boulder residential population. This visualization shows that residential density is consistently higher along these corridors, meaning that these future connections are within steps of 63% of Boulder's residents. And an even higher percentage, 89%, of Boulder residents who live in group settings like university dorms live within a half mile of the CAN work plan corridors. Access to opportunity is also a huge part of our COVID recovery. Although we hear a lot about housing affordability and rent burden, we also know that transportation is the second highest household cost. So connecting people to jobs with a range of mobility choices is part of lifting up those in our community who have experienced a lot of financial hardship. This visualization shows that 71% of Boulder jobs are within a half mile of a CAN corridor. When we consider our bus routes within Boulder, six of the 13 CAN work plan corridors carry high quality bus service. And that means um, buses that have headways of less than 15 minutes. And in terms of who we are connecting, 75% of total average daily boardings and alightings, that's um, people getting on and off the bus citywide, are happening along or within a half mile of our CAN work plan corridors. Lastly, this map shows a snapshot of the incredible wealth of community destinations like parks, schools, places of worship, and grocery stores that fall along or within walking distance of the corridors on the CAN work plan. All of these factors combined make a really strong case that the investment of our limited resources will have a reach far beyond the individual project areas. But I guess we don't need any more data to convince you of why this idea is quite compelling. So let's talk about how this will roll out. This slide maps out our work plan for the CAN. You'll see that seven of the council identified CAN corridors are active projects, meaning they are either already in design or they're approaching construction. This includes work along 28th Street, 30th Street, Colorado, East Arapahoe, Baseline, 13th, and the Valmont Road multi-use path part of that gun barrel connection. Then we have three 
priority corridors. These are the three streets listed at the top of the schedule. And we've taken stock of opportunities such as the pavement management program to accelerate the initiation of design and community engagement for these projects. So that's Baseline Road, Iris Avenue, and Folsom Street. We're also mindful of additional opportunities to assemble more funding for CAN corridors, including funding from CDOT, Colorado Department of Transportation, as well as potential Dr. Cog, that's Denver Regional Council of Governments, Transportation Improvement Program, the TIP funding applications. With external funding also comes timeline considerations. So this schedule reflects that. Lastly, design and community engagement for the remaining corridors will be initiated in 2023 or beyond. And that's Broadway, Pearl Street, Valmont Road in the downtown study. We will initiate design and community engagement along those three priority corridors, Baseline, Iris, and Folsom, starting in 2022 to 2024. These projects were selected for their value to the network in terms of providing enhanced multimodal north-south and east-west connectivity that's currently lacking in those areas of the city, as well as opportunity to couple investments and improvements with scheduled pavement resurfacing. We'll talk a little bit more about the status of our pavement management program later on in this presentation. As we have worked to reallocate staff resources to start work on the CAN work plan and developed that associated schedule that we just showed, we have been mindful of previous similar projects and the lessons learned. The typical project development process for project, projects like the one under consideration for our priority corridors is composed of multiple phases. Along the way, there are many factors that can influence the trajectory of a corridor project. Things like conflicting public opinions, syncing up with resurfacing schedules and contractors, floodplain and drainage constraints, the need for utility relocation or right-of-way acquisition, and even procurement hurdles like escalating costs and supply chain issues. Also, the start of construction sometimes does not immediately follow final design since capital funding availability varies and works differently project by project. So these can all influence project delivery. Um, we're committing to a steady pace for initiating design and community engagement on our priority corridors so that we use our staff and funding resources efficiently and account for the twists and turns that can come along the way. It's also important to note that community engagement is a continual part of the overall project development process. While input from consultation with the public is most concentrated towards the beginning of the process, as you can see with that gradient on the yellow bar, there are feedback loops that inform design every step of the way. As shown on this slide, input from the public has the most influence early on. And that's why investing in a community engagement strategy and doing that preparation and legwork to establish community relationships and local knowledge for each project corridor is so important. We have started to assemble funding for the CAN work plan corridors and we'll continue to scope additional budgetary needs as we get further along. We have already identified $1,215,000 for initiating design of the priority corridors in 2022 and 2023. These funding sources were previously earmarked for an update to the transportation master plan, which will now be delayed until 2023 or beyond. The neighborhood speed management program or NSMP, which you heard about earlier tonight, the neighborhood green streets program, as well as a small pocket of funds that was allocated to vision zero improvements. These work programs will be paused indefinitely to reallocate funding and staff time to this CAN work plan. Although there are trade-offs to pausing this work on our local streets and our master plan update, council requested these bold moves to accelerate work on our arterials. As I mentioned before, we're also happy to share that CDOT has committed one and a half million for the Arapaho corridor and will soon finalize commitment, we hope, um, for another million and a half dollars for the Broadway corridor. And we're also hopeful that our Dr. Cog tip and revitalizing Main Street applications that relate directly to CAN work plan corridors are successful. Our current regional and sub-regional TIP applications, if successful, would garner over $31 million in funds 
for CAN related work. As we embark on this work, we have launched a website so that our efforts on the CAN work plan are easily accessible and digestible. We have it set up so that it can evolve and grow over time too, and house corridor specific project information. And we will develop a community engagement strategy for each corridor that's tailored to those unique characteristics of the neighborhoods in which we will be working. Community engagement is an integral part of the overall project development process. Feedback from the community on existing conditions, challenges and opportunities, all that local knowledge that will be used to shape the overall design process. We wanna strengthen relationships with our community-based organizations and advocacy partners in this too, as well as develop new relationships that broaden the reach and quality of our engagement. We're also currently exploring a collaboration through the Boulder Walks program to offer community engagement support for individual projects such as walk audits, Spanish language and older adult focused engagement activities and community celebrations. Lastly, we're thankful to Alexi Davies and Community Cycles for inviting us to table at the upcoming Bicycle Film Festival on April 22nd, Earth Day, which is a fine event to debut our outreach materials on the CAN. So as I mentioned earlier, several of our CAN corridors have segments that are slated for roadway pavement resurfacing as part of our pavement management program. So tonight we thought it would be really helpful to just couple this presentation on the CAN with a quick update on the PMP and the Mobility Enhancements Initiative. And so now I'll hand it over to Garrett for this update. All right, um, again, for the record, my name is Garrett Slater, Principal Transportation Projects Engineer. And I am here to uh, talk about the Pavement Management Program and recognizing that we have two new board members, I thought it might be useful for us to just talk about why we have such a program. And um, so I'll, I'll say that um, for many years in the city of Boulder, taking care of our streets and our transportation infrastructure in general was a bit uh, reactive in nature. And there was not a formal uh, proactive method by which we would take care of the assets that we have under our care. And so in the um, mid 2000 aughts uh, to uh, the late uh, 2000 aughts going into 2010, the city created a formal pavement management program to help us take care of the 300 centerline miles of streets that we have within the city. And it's important to note that, uh, uh, for example, with the feedback we got during the public comment tonight, oftentimes we get uh, feedback about the quality of streets that we are not responsible for, such as 28th Street, uh, Arapahoe, Foothills Parkway, so on and so forth. These are all state highways that are outside the purview of our pavement management program because they are owned and maintained by the state of Colorado. And so CDOT or the Colorado Department of Transportation maintains those facilities. And so we have asset management programs for each of our major asset transportation categories. So pavement or streets, we also have sidewalk asset management programs, multi-use path maintenance programs and bridge asset management programs. And so with the uh, creation of the pavement management program, uh, as it was uh, uh, being uh, stood up and created and inventoried and, uh, and put together as a formal program in 2010 to 2012, there was obviously recognition uh, that there's a strong need for coordination with other city departments, such as the utilities department, so that we are not paving new streets one year before they come in to uh, replace a water line. And so that uh, coordination effort has become a well-oiled machine in terms of regular and, and, and frequent uh, touch points with other departments, not just utilities, but parks and open space, so on and so forth. And um, in recent years, it's been brought to our attention that we could also expand the scope and breadth of what the pavement management program is touching to include mobility enhancements. And uh, TAB was no small part of this uh, being brought to our attention. And so I'll, I'll pick up here with this slide here to note that the mobility enhancements that the pavement management program can be implementing uh, is consistent with the recommendations that are found in the low stress bike and not uh, bike and network uh, plan. And to help us also implement other programs such as the neighborhood speed management, which we no longer have, but uh, the neighborhood green streets, vision zero action plan. These are all examples of, of plans and programs that the pavement management program can help us um, move forward 
and, uh, and see progress on. Next slide. So examples of what the, the mobility enhancements that uh, we can see as a result of the PMP would entail signing and marking enhancements, minor operational changes such as adjustments to speed limits and adjustments to lane dimensions of vehicular lanes to, so that we can increase lane widths of, uh, of cycle lanes, and also minor infrastructure enhancements such as curb returns, um, curb bulb outs, and pedestrian ramps. Uh, which you can see in the, uh, the image on the right side of the screen here. Next slide. So what this does not include is uh, projects that would entail significant amounts of funding, uh, so millions and millions of dollars, because our payment management program doesn't have the bandwidth to accommodate that. It would not include significant operational study or involved community engagement, repurposing of travel lanes, right-of-way acquisition, and or parking removal. Next slide. So where we are uh, doing the, the work that uh, coordinates with the pavement management program are these three quarters of Lehigh Street near um, the, in the Table Mesa neighborhood, 17th Street in Central Boulder and Moorhead Avenue is another that we're exploring uh, in Martin Acres neighborhood. So if we go to the next slide and take a look at this. So Lehigh Street is an example of all the things that we can do. It didn't take significant, robust community engagement. We didn't have to repurpose parking. Uh, it didn't take uh, a gazillion dollars to, to implement. And it was actually uh, brought forward to us um, by TAB as a, a way to try to, as an example of a way that we can try to leverage the dollars uh, that we do have within the PMP to make incremental uh, enhancements to our mobility network. And so we have this uh, Safe Routes to School project that is implementing crossing treatments to improve safety for students and parents that are getting their students to Mesa Elementary by um, providing curb bump outs or neck downs and uh, crossing treatments across Lehigh, uh, which sometimes acts as a barrier for the neighborhoods to the east of Lehigh to get access to Mesa Elementary. It's also constructing a multi-use path to uh, uh, provide better off-street connectivity to Bear uh, Creek Elementary. There's a well-worn social path there that uh, largely we're going to take advantage of that alignment to build that multi-use path. And as a part of that Safe Routes to School funding, which is a grant funding that we uh, procured successfully from the Colorado Department of Transportation to use our local dollars, uh, to, to use those grant dollars then to, to go much further, we are coming in with the payment management program because Lehigh Street was identified as one that needs to be resurfaced. And we're going to be creating buffered bike lanes, which were not present before. This was a standard, um, bike lane facility. And so we're going to have now buffered bike lanes between Table Mesa uh, to Cragmore and a new climbing bike lane from Cragmore to Lafayette. And uh, so there's uh, the work for the Safe Routes to School project is already happening on the ground and uh, concrete work and concrete repairs to make way for the overall paving project, which uh, is already happening also. And the paving is scheduled to happen uh, this summer, uh, along with the, the pavement marking and the buffer bike lanes happening this summer. So a good example of how we can use the PMP to integrate um, with the, uh, the, the Vision Zero and the uh, mobility enhancements that uh, help us to further our TMP goals in an in, uh, incremental manner. Next slide. So 17th Street is uh, going to be implementing crossing markings at the arterial intersections, creating improved visibility at intersections by providing uh, ample space such as bike boxes for uh, people riding bikes as they approach intersections uh, to improve visibility for all um, and hopefully reduce conflict. And we'll also be implementing a southbound standard bike lane uh, from Pearl to Walnut, which is not present today. There's not sufficient um, width to be able to uh, implement a northbound bike lane in that segment, but we will be able to uh, implement a, a southbound bike lane, which is not present today. And Moorhead is slated for paving in 2023. And so we're going to be commencing the planning of the opportunities that are available to us uh, for additional mobility enhancements. Some of the capacity to implement um, potential larger scale enhancements will be limited because of the redirection of funds to the core arterial network planning that is going to be um, an increasing. Uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, if there are um, low hanging fruit type opportunities for us to implement this and uh, along Moorhead, we'll certainly explore those. 
And if we could go to the next slide, bringing this full circle back to uh, Valerie's presentation, uh, where the, uh, the PMP is also helping to further our TMP goals. So the baseline road is obviously one of our priority corridors in the CAN. Uh, and so we are going to be exploring what we can do to improve the, uh, the protection for existing bicycle lanes. Also looking at uh, modifications to, um, to bus stops so that we can create the floating bus islands that uh, reduce the need to play Frogger with vehicular traffic and buses uh, as they're stopped at transit stops and it's exploring opportunities for improved pedestrian crossing treatments. Um, I don't wanna steal any thunder from, uh, from Gene's update later uh, this evening on the tip, but we did get some positive feedback about the Baseline Road project as, uh, as a potential tip project also. So we uh, have a lot of staff discussion to come about uh, whether we can uh, make this sort of a two-phase project where we can implement some of the improvements as part of the PMP and then come in uh, later and do uh, additional enhanced opportun uh, improvements um, with tip funding. So I think that's the uh, end of the PMP portion of this presentation. Yeah, thanks, Garrett. And you know, with that, here are the websites for the CAN and the PMP. If you want to check those out, um, we're now available to take your questions. Thanks, Garrett and Valerie. Valerie, I think you told the story of the CAN far better than I ever could, and it was it was neat to see all the statistics that you had compiled that I don't have the time or ability to do. Um, so that was, that was really neat to see. I feel like this was a lot of information, especially probably for our new members. So with that, um, with this, there's there's no formal recommendation from TAB. This is just an opportunity for us as individuals to ask questions and and provide feedback on these these items that I think will be coming to us at a further, at a later date um, as individual items where we'll be able to talk about them in more detail. But if anyone has any general questions or feedback, now would be a great time to ask. Alex, I have something. Yep, go ahead. Um, really great stuff. Um, I think this is one of the most exciting projects um, that, that I've seen come to tab um, in my, my year uh, on the board, uh, which is really working hard for multiple of the TMP goals in a really straightforward way. Um, and I'm grateful for the, the co-creation that happened between tab and staff on the, the vision and the early framework. Uh, and I have just a few questions uh, about implementation at this point. Um, so the first is looking at the, the schedule. Let's see, I don't need to know where I put it. But there, was a, there was kind of a work plan schedule on one of these slides um, for the different, different um, bikeways. And it had um, Iris, I think Iris and Folsom. Uh, and there was a key and it showed that um, when construction would happen, there are different, different letter codes. And C was construction. I didn't see a C or construction phase for those. And I'm just wondering if, if there's any anything staff can share on when construction is expected for Folsom and Iris. Yeah, up at the top there, the green rows. Gary, you might be on mute. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I can speak to that, Ryan. So the reason we're not showing construction is uh, it would seem disingenuous to the, the study and design effort to commit to a specific construction timeframe without knowing the full scope of what we're looking to actually build and implement. So uh, on most all of these uh, rows where you're seeing Cs for construction, it's where we have a general um, uh, or a, a pretty strong understanding of what it is we actually want to build and implement. And so on those corridors, we need to uh, spend time working with the community and with specific stakeholder interests and groups to uh, identify what the, uh, the, the project will look like and how it will ultimately take shape. Okay, that makes sense. Is, is there anything kind of like a back of the napkin bookends you can do? I mean, is it looks like mo many of these, the C ranges go from two to maybe five ranges, so is, I don't want to force it, but I'm just curious. Can you? Is there a way to think about likely minimum and maximum? I mean, if it's committed, right? If it's if it's committed to happen, um. right? So I would say it, it really. So it's going to be contingent on and a function of the, the the recommendations that come out of these studies and these designs. And the uh, so if the the design that comes out of the Iris Avenue work uh, is something that is easily implementable, then we could potentially see C's happening in 2024. 
uh, if it's a little more robust uh, in nature, then it might push out to an additional year. Uh, and then same for Folsom Street, um, that uh, we could potentially see those seas lining up in 25. Um, but if it's a little more substantial in nature, then it could um, take a little more uh, time to build the funding for such a project to come together. Okay, so it's really about, the question is about, is about the engineering and design um, requirements. And that, that's what would define the time. Correct. Got it. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you, Garrett. I have one or two other questions, um, more on the the, um, the just success factors of getting this done. And um, I'm just wondering if if there's anything we've learned from previous cases where we've had to pull back from bikeways like Folsom or, or otherwise, um, and, and if there's any lessons that we take from that to this, um, and specifically things that like city council should be ready for, or that we should be ready for to help, um, you know, just, I don't know, any, any lessons that, that come from the past that, that we bring forward on this? You know, um, I think part of what I wanted to lay out in the presentation this evening is um, that that process um, and how important community engagement is to the overall project development process. And I talked about how there's just a continual community engagement throughout the life of a project um, all the way to construction. Um, and that that community engagement is most intensive and most important in the beginning of the process. So, you know, we're going to be working really hard to develop community engagement strategies before we start doing um, any work on these corridors so that we're setting up these projects for a successful process. Um, so that's one thing I think is important to note. Um, you know, I think in terms of lessons learned from previous projects um, is that we just have to pay careful attention to the relationships that we build, the local knowledge that we tap um, to inform the design process. Um, that's, I think, something that, that will be integrated into every corridor. Um, Garrett, is there anything you'd like to add? I, I would just reinforce what you said, Valerie, and that if you look at some successful models that have been deployed in the city, 30th in Colorado and East Arapaho are to me are great examples of that. And when you look at the, the level of community engagement that uh, was put forward on, on those corridors, I think, uh, and now we are actually out and building and implementing those with the support of the community, uh, it speaks to the importance of that being a key part of the, the overall process. Thanks, and I, I suppose, um, I don't know if there's a question here, but I'm just, Valerie, I'm thinking about your, your response and um, I'm thinking maybe the, um, the, the point that I haven't really crystallized either in my own mind here, but it's something like, uh, are there, are there, is there messaging that um, is important both for the, for the city, for, for city residents and, and I guess council on how we talk about this and what this is? Like, is this something that we're just, we're trying out and is pilot and we're welcoming the public's feedback to consider if they like it or not? Or is this maybe a, as another example, a decision that we are making uh, with respect to values because we are in a climate emergency and we're creating, um, we're giving rights to, to groups that haven't had it before and this is happening. Um, so those are two kind of different different takes and, and maybe this needs more thought, but I'm just wondering if there's anything that, um, actually I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I guess I just, it's on my mind that there's on the subject of public engagement that it seems like there might be something here that is about getting staff and tab and council aligned on with respect to like this is this is what we're this is what we're selling <laughs> i guess because because of course there's going to be there's going to be feedback and there's going to be noise um but if, if we if there's been a a values-based decision by our leadership to make this happen um it's important that we you know i guess i'll get behind that i guess that's a comment not a question but feel free to reply. If, I could, if i could just quickly offer um it's I guess our job is um, staff to be able to provide choices and provide options to both you and ultimately to council and to be able to um, identify what the issues are um, and implications much as you had just described and ultimately it's going to be council's choice about how they balance the myriad of um, goals and objectives that the city has in accomplishing um, and moving further toward you know, the vision for the city. And so I, I think that's the framing of it. 
And as we go through and we, and we do both um, studies and then pre-design and design, we're trying to keep that always in mind because um, there, you know, as public comment showed earlier um, this evening, there's a myriad of perspectives on a number of different topics in transportation. Okay. Okay, thanks, Erica. Maybe one more one more question, and I'll I'll stop. Valerie, um, is there anything that for Tab that you know if, if we or I guess other advocates in the city that we're we're doing work to, um, just try to make sure folks understand the the benefits that that are coming their way in this. I mean, I think there's. I'm just guessing. I know a lot of people who bike commute were daily. They, they they have no idea that this is happening. And if if they did, they would probably line up, be ready to line up and support, come to whatever meeting. Is there anything that TAB or advocates can do, should start to do, because as you said, early on is when the, the action is going to be the most the most useful. Um, and I mean, just like an example, next next week, uh, Wednesday, April 20th, is BVSD's bike, to, bike walk to school day. Um, there's going to be tons of parents gathered and, you know, there could be signups if anybody's organizing. So I'm just wondering if you might have any call to action for TAB. You can also think about it, but I um, just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Ryan. I, I, I think one thing that's important to to think about in terms of lessons learned from previous efforts and and how we can, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, solidify an approach for these projects is um, that broadening the reach of our engagement to groups that don't usually interact with transportation and mobility conversations, I think that can go a long way to generating that groundswell of community support for this work. You know, as Erica mentioned earlier, there are trade-offs that we will be communicating there, you know, as well as benefits of these projects and helping uh, a wide range of folks understand that and um, get behind these projects, I think is gonna be really important for, um, you know, bringing these projects to fruition. And a role that TAB, um, can play, and, and I mentioned this as I um, presented to Community Cycles not too long ago, um, is to help us identify some of those community-based organizations or groups um, that are out there that might not always plug in to transportation conversations, but when you really think about it, some of the issues that they're working with, um, you know, transportation is actually very fundamental to people's day-to-day -day lives. So um, I can imagine there are um, parent groups, um, there are um, groups that work with older adults. Um, I, I could see folks that work with housing issues being really interested in these conversations um, if they are invited into these spaces. Um, and so that's a role that I think TAB and, and other advocacy organizations could really help with is helping us um, have and start up those conversations to bring people into the process. Thanks, Valerie. Yeah, let's love to continue this and on, on the subject of organizing. How can, how can we help to organize and make sure that the right folks know what, what meetings to attend and that, that sort of thing. Thanks, it was great. Thanks, Ryan. Anyone else from TAB? Yeah, I have a couple of comments and a couple of questions. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that uh, really thorough presentation. Um, it was helpful to get the background on everything since I feel like I'm catching up on a lot of stuff. Um, so yeah, first I have a couple comments. Um, uh, one is just um, related to the fatality data kind of in the spirit of what Tila mentioned at the top here. There are a few fatalities missing from the map. Um, just wanted to flag. Um, one was from, all of them happened last year. Um, Ralph Cook, Brock Foreman and David Volmar. Um, one is on Diagonal and one is on South Boulder Road. So the South Boulder Road one is marked as a serious, crash, but not a fatality. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to flag those that there are a few missing on the map. Thank you, Rebecca. It might be because that data reflects 2018 to 2020, which is what the Boulder um, Safe Streets report um, looked at. Um, which was recently published and is on our website. Um, so as we continue to prepare community engagement materials, we can always um, look at different date ranges to get a broader um, perspective of the crashes that are out there. Um, but I just wanted to make that kind of technical note there that it's um, that it might be because of the time frame that the Safe Streets report analyzed. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the, the legend on it says to 2022. And I guess that's why I was um, confused about it. Um, oh, yeah, sorry about that. No, no, it's okay. I just, I, I appreciate it. If that makes sense. It was, yeah, up to 2020, then those wouldn't have been included. Um, thank you. 
Um, yeah, and one other uh, comment is, um, I, I was just thinking about, I really appreciated the picture you painted of the, the intention of the can, of, you know, coordinated effort across the different arterial streets. Um, and I would also just add to that, um, I think this is implicit, but making explicit, it's also making, it's making these roads certainly safer for, for all sorts of modes, um, but including people who are driving, since a lot of people who are hurt in our transportation are in cars. So I just want to emphasize that it's, it's really benefits for all modes. Um, of course, the uh, facilities for people walking and rolling and, um, and transit, but also just really benefiting people who are driving too by, by keeping them safe. So again, I think that was implicit, but I just like to always kind of call it out so people recognize that whatever changes are coming are, are to benefit people driving and um, as well for their, for their safety. Um, uh, so I have two questions though uh, beyond that. Um, one is sort of following up on what um, uh, Ryan was asking about is, I'm curious if there are, um, like if, if, I think this happened on Folsom, like if there's the potential that there would be interim treatments, for instance, if there's a design that um, is more of a quick build project, for instance, converting a lane to a protected bike lane with concrete planters or those kinds of projects where you can kind of, you can try it. And then in the future, when you have funds for a more complete sort of redesign, if necessary, pursue that. Is that part of the consideration? Is that something that could be pursued, like would be considered if it, if it sped up the timelines for implementation and sort of a phased approach with iteration over time? Um, or, or is that not likely to be sort of a path um, that would be pursued? I could take a stab at this one, Valerie, and follow up if I uh, misspeak. But uh, I think I would say, Rebecca, that um, that is an uh, effort that we've uh, tried uh, with varying degrees of success in the past uh, of doing uh, sort of a test implementation. And sometimes uh, it's worked out and we've gone with a full implementation. I suspect that um, whether we do a sort of a, a test implementation or a full scale implementation of a, a, a project concept, would be a function of the type of community input and feedback that uh, that we receive, as well as of the the budget that we have to implement what the uh, the, the potential project scope may include. I think the only thing I would add is that you know council and and tab in in the past you know have really articulated a need to be bold. So I think that's part of that project development process chart that I presented earlier um, is that moving forward, we can really formalize our steps um, across these corridors um, and um, you know, hopefully accelerate the process um, and you know, really try to see improvements on the ground um, be more you know, permanent as part of these processes. Um, and I think that does speak to some of the, the lessons learned from previous approaches. Um, you know, sometimes when things are um, called low cost, or they're called interim or they're pilots, um, it can change the conversation with the public in a way that is not always um, you know, a, 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 an informative conversation. Um, and so I think um, if we can kind of standardize that dialogue across our projects, it might help us um, you know, continue to make progress um, on projects and um, you know, you know, maybe have more um, beneficial conversations. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, thanks. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, I just have one last question, which is about um, the pavement management program. And I'm curious, I was curious why, um, so there's the list of sort of things that can be included in the mobility enhancements and things that can't. Um, and I was curious, I, I have some guesses, but I was curious what your, your thoughts are on why, um, why the like things like, um, uh, reallocation of space on the roadway, assuming it's mostly changes in where the paint is as opposed to putting something new um, on top of the roadway. Um, I'm wondering why those are excluded from this program, why reallocation of space is excluded from eligibility from for that program. I, I, I would say, um... And, and to clarify, it's it's where the threshold resides is going to be a little tricky, uh, at, and to say that it's it's absolutely this line because each corridor is going to vary uh, a bit. And we are reallocating space on the Lehigh project, as we noted, by creating the buffered uh, where today it's standard bike lanes. 
But uh, primarily, it's going to be in corridors where um, uh, it might be viewed by some that there's some pain involved with reallocation of space. And an example would be taking away on-street parking. Um, that's the kind of uh, uh, task that entails a whole lot of community engagement. And the pavement management program uh, endeavors to tackle um, more or less around seven to 10 miles, depending on how um, good our pricing is with a contractor in a given year of paving. And we simply don't have uh, all the time, the resources uh, to be able to do that type of engagement with all the stakeholders and the affected parties uh, when we're talking about taking away on-street parking um, and be able to get, uh, and then have time left in the year, the calendar year to be able to do all that paving. Um, so therefore th those sorts of really big endeavors and efforts uh, will take more time. And that's why we've said they're outside the scope of the pavement management program it would be more of a, 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 a singular effort. Um, okay, I Thank would you. like to, I would like to add to your question, Rebecca, um, in, in, in this point, would, would you be considering any exclusions, for example, for the Moorhead Road, where that could be very easily done, considering that there's already a no parking um, side of the road, and I think it would be a, a, a very productive solution. But um, going back with what Rebecca was saying, would it be possible in certain stances to consider reallocation or no? Uh, yes, I would say we're always open to considering that uh, up front. And if it appears in the uh, uh, in the the course of uh, uh, getting the project moving along uh, that uh, it's going to be a substantial effort, that's when we would need to make a decision uh, about whether that could be done in the context of the PMP or if it should be a standalone project. So at the beginning, we're, we're not immediately uh, sort of dismissing those ideas if, if the, it appears that they might be able to be easily implemented. Thank you. Sheila? Well, thanks. Um, part of what I wanted to talk about was, you know, hopping right onto that. Um, so I'm curious to hear Garrett say we're, we're not ruling it out when the memo quite clearly seems to say we're ruling it out. Um, and I, I did want to ask about that because it wasn't clear to me from the memo was was the um, um, no removal of on street parking kind of rule was that about can in general or just the PMP portion about how thinking about can can um, piggyback on existing efforts and so I just wanted to clarify uh, can thinking does not necessarily out rule out um, those bullet points that are kind of listed as no goes for um, the PMP plan, specifically um, operational changes, removal of on street parking, reallocation, uh, repurposing travel lanes. Can we be very clear on the record tonight that CAN might be um, considering all of those things? Y yes. Uh, I don't, and uh, I regret that there might be some misunderstanding about that. So in the context of the PMP, we're saying that um, that's generally going to be the case, that we're not going to be open to those things because the- For PMP. Need, yeah, for the PMP. Yeah. That we, that, that we need, that, the, that um, the primary goal is getting the streets paved and right. within the time frame that's limited that we can, we would like to make those mobility enhancements. But within uh, the context of the CAN, those are all on the table. Okay. We're not just missing those with the can. Thank you. I, I was, I'm, I feel happy, happier <laughs> having asked that then. Uh, my next question is about some of this um, need for community engagement and the level of community engagement. I, 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 I feel particularly dull because I feel like I've asked this question multiple times in different contexts and I still don't really have a good way to tell. When do we know whether we're at a consult versus an inform um, level of engagement, when do we know when to stop listening? Because um, in particular, this memo is talking about how CAN is kind of already in the 2019 TMP, the low stress walk and bike plan, the Boulder Valley Comp plan, the climate action plan. Like, haven't we listened enough? Isn't this the time to take the information that we've gathered and said, 
here is what we've decided to do and then move to the level of inform. Why, why if we've rebranded some effort and called it CAM, why do we have to start from the beginning and rethink community engagement? Or how, how do we decide how, what, what level of community engagement we're doing? Don't we have enough? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll start on this one and, and Garrett, please feel free to chime in. I think, um, Tila, this is, this is a, a great conversation to have, I think, as we embark on what can maybe be, you know, some pretty intensive and complex projects. Um, you know, the, the planning and, and strategic policy documents that, that we mentioned tonight, whether it's the TMP, the yep. low stress plan, gotcha. all of those, they are really um, kind of setting out a framework and a policy direction but they don't necessarily get into detailed design as part of what the output of those documents were. And the project development process that we talked about tonight is really important because that's where we get into the details of feasibility. Um, we get into analysis and we, we get into the, like the overall design process. And um, that has not happened for those segments. They may have been called out in those plans as having a modal priority or an emphasis, um, or they've, they've been designated um, because of their value to certain part of the network. Um, but that detailed design conversation has not yet happened. And I think that's what, um, you know, is, is something we want to be really deliberate about as we approach um, these projects, especially the ones that have the potential to get, you know, into a pretty, um, you know, high level of complexity. Um, so that's one thing I would just mention that um, we, when you asked earlier about when do things go from consult to, to inform, inform. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it really is kind of a spectrum along that project development process. Um, and I'm not talented enough to bring this up on the screen and talk at the same time. So if you can remember that yellow bar yes, that represented no, the community good. engagement, it had a gradient on it. Um, that's really kind of representing when we're going from consult um, and in the early part of the process where input is really um, influencing the design process and then kind of tapers out as you get closer to final design and implementation and construction where we're really more into the inform end of the spectrum. So there are no hard and fast rules. Um, we don't, you know, put something on our website to say, okay, we're now an inform, um, but it is part of the process. It is something that that does change over time as we go through the steps. Um, and, you know, I think um, that we do still need to consult the community uh, on this um, suite of projects because a lot of these projects involve significant trade-offs. Um, so that is something that we're doing mm -hmm. um, very deliberately to make sure that we're setting up these projects for success and building the support that is needed for our elected officials to continue to support the projects as well. Okay, so some of those trade-offs um, definitely impact people who are not part of our community, right? I mean, that's why we're talking about these arterials. They are places definitely that, you know, our community members use to access their jobs outside of the community or, you know, far away from their homes, but we are under no uh, illusions that this is the same flavor of thing as a speed hump you know, on an exceedingly low traffic street in a neighborhood. What would our obligation, I suppose, look like to contact and consult those outside users? Um, and at what point do we say, sorry, this is our community, you're coming in and you're gonna just drive slower here because there's too many of you and you are killing our residents, you're killing our visitors, you're killing your fellow commuters. At what point do we, um, decide that that kind of outreach and, you know, our, our tent is big enough that we've got to stop asking for input and start implementing what we need. You know, I think um, Erica mentioned this earlier that our role as staff um, and, you know, engineering and planning professionals on these projects is really to collect that information, collect that feedback. Um, some of it influences the design process. Um, ultimately, we will be presenting a series of choices, um, you know, with our elected officials, um, uh -huh. and they are the decision makers on these projects, right? So, um, you know, I think we would take all the input we get, whether it's from local residents or, um, you know, folks in the region, um, and assemble that input for our city council to consider and, and tab along the way before we get to that point. Um, okay. So I think that that's something that 
um, is an objective part of the, the professional process that we will undertake. Okay, I would just like to raise this as a, I'm total outsider and not a professional on this one. Um, one of the best ways to get impact uh, or feedback about the impacts of a proposal is to try it out, <laughs> like to make them try it out. And I think this is where uh, Becky's coming from about quick build and um, uh, trying some, you know, trial implementations of this stuff. I think you can put as many signs along the, uh, a commuter's route that say we're considering some kind of thing and look up this website or this phone number that you can't actually do while you're you know driving along versus is actually trying a reallocation of road space that um, changes people's perspective uh, of how they use the road and that's really when you're going to get some very you're going to you're going to get the roaches coming out from under the you know the carpet and if you were trying to hear from everybody and from all of these multiplicity of perspectives that Erica was talking about earlier, um, I would give a pitch for, for feeling out and trying out in real time on real road space, some of the things that, that we're considering doing, because I fear that um, city council having asked to sign off on um, unknowns and, um, sort of hypothetical changes to a roadway without really having um, feedback from real road users when it happens are, are still going to, we might still find ourselves in the Folsom situation. We are like, well, we didn't have all the information and we didn't know, we, we couldn't feel their pain. Um, so I just, I just wanna put that out there as a, just a way to have a realistic gut check of what we are thinking of doing. Because I think to make real changes, to make actual speed mitigation happen, to make people drive more slowly, drive more carefully, drive more consciously of other users on the road, we have to change the road to do it. And to say we that we are collecting feedback in a hypothetical space about what it will look like and feel like is not going to satisfy either the road users who will, um, be experiencing that change and those impacts or city council who is going to be asked to, to put their necks out about it. Uh, and I think that trying to get feedback from far flung members of our user base, not necessarily our community, but you know, these 60,000 in commuters, whatever the number is these days, is notoriously difficult. And the best way to do it is to actually impact them first. Yeah, thank you, Tila and, and Rebecca also for your comments on that. Um, I think these are all really great considerations for us to keep in mind as those are approaches to community engagement. And although they involve the engineering of trying to figure out, um, you know, how to put things on, on the road in an interim fashion to test things out, mm -hmm. um, it really, you're, what you're speaking to is, is one approach to community engagement. And it's certain some, certainly something we can continue to keep in our toolbox and consider um, for these different projects. I think they're all going to have different needs and, you know, depending on the nature of the project, um, the geography that we're working within, within the city. Um, and, you know, it's, some, it's uh, you know, I definitely appreciate your feedback on that because it's certainly something we can consider as a tool. Um, you know, I'd also mention that, you know, from experience on previous projects, um, you know, in, in other cities who have tried those approaches on, on different projects with different results, um, the kind of um, time frame for a, a pilot um, really is something that I think a lot of cities have have learned needs to be uh, much longer than than folks have really done in the past. Um, you know, I think that uh, it takes time for folks to really, um, you know, settle into new driving patterns, settle into mm -hmm. new uh, patterns of using the road. Um, you know, whether you're driving, you're walking, you're bicycling, you're using the bus, you know, it takes a long time, you know, weeks, if not months. Um, in fact, in, in New York City, they, they um, have committed to doing pilots for more than um, a year um, because they found that you need that, that length and duration of time to really um, see the, the results of, of that change and to have the, the actual substantive community conversations that are needed um, for the elected officials to make an ultimate decision. So I really appreciate your feedback on that and that's something we can consider. Okay. I think my last comment on this, yes. 
I just wanted to add to you that this, this is certainly not the only opportunity that you'll have to provide input input into what the public engagement will look like. There will be- Oh, I wasn't worried about that. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, I think that the last thing that stood out for me on the memo was the paragraph that says, as a next step, project development for each CAN corridor will build from the policy direction and closely explore existing conditions advance conceptual designs and examine the feasibility of proposed project elements responsive to the needs of each quarter. And these are all feeling like planning to plan. And I'm hearing Valerie say, you know, this stuff, stuff takes time, I get it, I've been around, I see how long it takes to fund these projects. And so my last question to you staff is, what can we do in the meantime that feels like we are getting something done? You know, I think that's something when when we got this direction from city council, um, you know, earlier this year, we we started to just chart out what are we currently working on um, and then what remains. And, you know, that's something that that, you know, we've we've shown in the slides tonight that we've we've chosen to accelerate three projects, those priority corridors, um, because we're taking advantage of. Um, either the fact that they're part of um, the pavement resurfacing program. Um, or their, their key connections, either north, south, or east, west, that have just repeatedly, through previous feedback um, and, and explorations with the community, been identified. So, um, you know, I think that is, is what we wanted to convey tonight, is that um, we see those three projects as, as ones that are just ripe for accelerating the process, not doing lengthy studies, really doing, um, you know, the, the necessary work to develop a community engagement strategy and set the project up for success. Um, but we, you know, we will do um, the, in the typical analysis that we need just to make informed decisions about the design process. But I think what we're trying to express tonight is um, that, that we are accelerating that process. So in that, that chart that I had on the screen, we're talking yep. months instead of years um, to, to go through those steps. Um, so we're, we're committing to doing that kind of accelerated process that you might not have seen previously on other projects. Are you confident that that um, speed ha has been um, communicated to council? Um, in, in what setting? I don't know. Um, <laughs> some council members think, yay, we're going to do CAN. Here we are. It's on the staff work plan. Um, and uh, I, I, they, I think there's some expectation to see some changes, you know, in the next year or two. And what, what I'm seeing is, you know, exploring, advancing, conceptual, examining feasibility. Um, I, I just, I'm wondering what, what kind of expectations from the city manager's office or from council we're frustrating or meeting. You know, I think, oh, go ahead, Erica. I was going to say, I, I think that there's a level of clarity of understanding um, that was given to us that, you know, council wanted to accelerate these projects um, on the CAN network in order to actually construct a project, even if it's um, just putting some um, additional paint or whatever to separate portions of the roadway um, surface, there still needs to be at least some level of um, design and analysis that goes with it. And I think that uh, whenever council was talking about it, um, I felt that there was clarity given to us that they wanted things to be able to happen much more quickly. Um, yes. But the same token that there was an, also an understanding that um, folks were understood there were going to be things that took time that took beyond two years in order to implement the CAN network um, as was envisioned. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tila. Trini, do you have anything? Okay. I have a, a couple of thoughts that are probably future questions. Um, but one of the questions I get asked about can a lot is what's the top priority? And what I what I tell people is that the the, the objective is to be opportunistic. And it's not one of these is, is a higher priority than the other, but to, we should jump on these opportunities as they come to us, whether it's a tip opportunity or a maintenance opportunity. And I think a, a subtlety that is somewhat lost on can is that some things that we have studied like 30th in Colorado are depicted on the map and in the talking points as a, as a project to pursue in the near term. And East Arapaho, it's, it's more of an acknowledgement that a plan took place. And, and that's one where I think 
it, we wouldn't be as opportunistic if we were to go after things like the TIP projects that have been proposed on, on East Arapaho. Um, that's just one thing I wanted to, to share. And then uh, it was interesting to see that 44% of crashes happen on CAN. It'd be, I'd be curious what percent of the roadway network that is. Um, I probably sound like a broken record when I keep repeating that 67% of our crashes happen on 17% of our streets. I think a, a parallel sort of statistic from CAN of 44% of our crashes happen on uh, blank percent of our streets would be, would be a cool thing to know. Turning to PMP, uh, Moorhead is in an area where I think there's the highest concern in our community about the impacts of Steve South and thinking through that corridor as an important connection between future CU South and Willville main campus, East campus is, uh, I think could, could do a lot of good uh, moving forward and help ease some of the concern. And it would be good to sooner than later bring the university as a partner in the conversation. And perhaps they could be a funding partner and a, an engagement partner uh, in that effort. And then finally, uh, 17th Street, it looks like the only 17th Street, which has a, a bike lane on it that's slated for, for resurfacing soon, looks like the only intersecting bikeway is on Walnut. And so I'd be curious if it would be possible to install a protected intersection at that location, or since that location's in the context of a very walkable downtown, if we could bulb out all of the corners there. Those streets have on-street parking, but of course you can't park at the corner, which means that on every corner, there's an additional eight plus feet that pedestrians have to walk to cross the street. And so if we could narrow the crossing distances by, by 16 feet in every direction, I think that would be a, a huge benefit to the downtown or um, explore a bikeway and, and bolster the, the bikeway network that way. That's all I have. But, Thank you very much for this presentation. I've never seen this much happening in this department all at once. And I think this is the, these objective, these projects are very well aligned with our, our needs. And so I think it's an exciting time in, in Boulder transportation. So thanks, Valerie. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. With that, we will move on to the curbside management program. And I see Liv has unmuted and is maybe ready to present. And hey, Chris. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm gonna be kicking it off. Go ahead. All right, we'll get Liv to share her screen. All right, thank you, Liv. All right, good evening, Tab. Chris Aglin here, Principal Planner. Uh, tonight, we're here to provide an update on our curbside management project. I am joined by Liv, our project manager, and Carly from our consultant team. Next slide, please. So tonight we wanna to review uh, just briefly uh, the project background since we do have two new TAB members. Uh, but the main focus is really gonna be reviewing findings from our community engagement process. And then we're also gonna provide some updates on our work on existing conditions and also discuss the role of pilot projects and some of the ideas that we have received throughout the stakeholder process. Uh, we're gonna finish with some next steps and a discussion of the questions that were provided to you in your memo. Next slide, please. So just as some project context, um, there's a key set of policy documents that guide all of our work, uh, including the work here on curbside management. Uh, these include the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, our Transportation Master Plan, City's Climate Action Plan, for example, and also the guiding principles that are laid out in the Access Management and Parking Strategies, or as we say, AMPS um, documents. Um, these documents work together, much like the gears represented here, uh, and share a number of interrelated goals. Um, these include Vision Zero, uh, our safety goals, uh, VMT and GHG reduction, both in our TMP and the Climate Action Plan, mode shift, and of course, you know, in everything we do, we want to have that, that lens of social equity, um, diversity, and inclusion as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so within the AMPS program itself, there are 
pretty uh, wide variety of projects and programs, some of which are ongoing, uh, some of which we're uh, implementing now, and, and some of which are yet to be implemented and hopefully will be started soon. Uh, for example, CAMP, our Chautauqua Access Management Program, is an ongoing pilot program at Chautauqua, providing a free shuttle and managing uh, parking there at the park. Um, the Neighborhood Access Management and Parking Pricing Projects uh, were the last AMPS projects we went through uh, and are now in the implementation phases. And then hopefully we're going to start the Parking Code and TDM Ordinance work with Planning and Development Services later this year. Uh, but for tonight, we are focused, of course, on curbside management. So um, the purpose of this project and why we are looking at updating how the city manages the curb is primarily that the curb is a public resource and it's a limited resource. There is a limited supply. Um, however, we're seeing certainly a growing number of competing demands. Um, there are also some new emerging demands uh, related to transportation technologies and improvements uh, and changes in services. Um, TNCs like Uber and Lyft are a great example of that, and micromobility. Um, there are also some demands we've seen more recently related to COVID's uh, impact on travel behavior and how goods and services are delivered or, in a lot of cases, picked up by the public. Uh, given these issues of supply and demand, there's going to be trade-offs and, and discussions about trade-offs that, that need to be made uh, if, if we're going to change how the curb is used uh, in this limited supply. The curb itself is also that transition area, uh, the place where people access their destinations and also connect with a variety of transportation options. Lastly, uh, effective and efficient curbside management policies and practices are yet another lever out of many to advance our community goals. So this slide itself uh, illustrates the wide variety of demands on the curb. Historically, we know that the curb has been most associated with parking and vehicle storage and also ADA uh, access. Uh, the delivery of goods depends on loading zones and transit service relies on the curbside space for the unloading and loading of passengers. Um, in the city, we are seeing an increased need to uh, safely manage TNC pickup and drop off uh, and also organize our micro mobility devices. Um, and we all know that COVID has certainly created an increased uh, demand for short-term short access uh, to goods and services as well. But we'll be looking at all of these uh, different competing demands as we go through the project. Next slide, please. Based on best practices and, and your input and input from other stakeholders that we've talked to, we've identified a, a set of specific objectives to this curbside management work. Uh, we've heard your desire to emphasize the human experience, to make sure that people of all ages, backgrounds, incomes, and abilities have access and have a choice when it comes to how they travel and the choices for how the curb uh, influences them. Uh, within our districts, uh, there are a variety of needs, and we need to be able to customize our approach uh, to satisfy those various needs. Uh, we need to make sure that the curb is easy to use, it, that it's clear uh, what different designations are. It's clear to the people who are gonna use them. Um, for city staff too, there needs to be clarity. We need to establish standard operating procedures uh, to determine curbside use, and then also to respond to requests for changes in how curbsides may be used. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we need to strategically implement policies and practices to help achieve our community goals. Um, finally, uh, we need to adapt. Uh, there's a lot of different emerging technology that impacts how people travel, uh, and we need to respond to that uh, over time as well. Um, and with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Liv for the next section. Thanks, Chris. Um, Liv Lewin, Senior Transportation Planner. Uh, thanks for having us tonight. Um, now I'm going to uh, dive in a little more into kind of some of the key tasks of the project, um, keeping in mind that the deliverable, the, the goal that we have in sight is that program guidebook for implementation. Um, and to get there, uh, we've started by analyzing existing conditions. So doing 
a detailed inventory of curb uses, looking at parking occupancy, um, making observations in the field, um, and as well as doing um, community engagement, which will continue throughout the project. Um, and uh, one thing that we're gonna be highlighting tonight uh, in just a few minutes are um, some highlights from existing conditions, as well as the round of community engagement that we just did. Um, we're also looking at best practices and learning from what other cities are doing. The concept of curbside management is actually fairly new, um, but we're learning from, uh, from these other cities and some, uh, some guides that are being produced for uh, the industry regarding this. Um, we are taking a look at what our current policies and regulations are now and assessing where we might uh, need to make changes uh, to be able to implement uh, the, the curb uses that we want in the future. And then um, we're going to be doing a task where we kind of look at different options, analyze those, and ultimately come to some recommendations that go into that guidebook. Uh, with the standard operating procedures for staff for both proactive changes um, as well as reactive that are like requests from the community. To support this, um, we are exploring the uh, potential to do some pilot projects to put some things out there and, and learn from them. And um, so that's also a part of this overall process. The overall schedule, um, uh, extends. It, we started in the in the fall of 2021, and it will extend about another year from now um, into spring of 2023. So while this is a, a citywide program and plan, we do have uh, three key focus areas of downtown. Boulder Junction and University Hill. These are our commercial districts where we have managed parking and where we're seeing those various competing demands for the curb that Chris mentioned before. So in terms of community engagement, um, we've done a lot of that, particularly the first quarter of this year, um, but we actually started with our Access Allies group, um, which is our stakeholder group with various representatives, including Tila and Ryan from TAB. We appreciate your participation, as well as those um, from a variety of districts and organizations to really get diverse perspectives um, that will support this project throughout. We've already had three meetings so far and we'll have another three um, throughout the course of the project. Um, we just had a questionnaire open on our website, accessforboulder.com. That was open for several weeks um, where we got to um, really start talking about some of those trade-offs, uh, again, that, that Chris mentioned, right? Um, so people may want to see more of something on the curb, and that will mean that we need to see probably less of something else to make that happen. So we wanted to start that trade-off discussion, and Carly will give you a snapshot of some of the results about that in a moment. So to complement the questionnaire, we also have had a number of different focus groups um, really to get at the diversity of users. I won't read all of those on there, but um, we talked with people like um, representatives from RTD, VIA, Lyft, business owners, students from CU, um, and, and really, um, uh, really to dive in deep to what people think is working well, what needs to be improved, um, and again, what they would like to see more of and less of. We also had pop-up events in each of these districts where we had one-on-one -on -one conversations and encouraged people to take the questionnaire, um, had some discussion via Spanish Facebook posts as well, and have been going to our district commissions and advisory boards like yourselves. So um, that's a quick update on what we've done for community engagement. And now I'd like to turn it over to Carly to give you some of the highlights of what we heard during that community engagement. Thank you, Liz. 
And again, Carly C. from Fran Pierce. Um, so the questionnaire that we sent out got 267 responses. We asked people what mode they took to get to or travel within each of these three districts. And we saw a really great distribution of people driving, walking, biking, taking transit, carpooling from all modes. So uh, a good sense and, and feel comfortable with the, the array of modes being used in these three districts. So um, respondents could then at, answer the questions of what curb uses do they want to see more of and what do they want to see less of for downtown Boulder Junction and or University Hill. So they could select one, two, or three of those districts. So we're just showing downtown here to give you a sample. Um, we got almost everybody who responded to the survey responded for downtown. Uh, we got about 100 responses for University Hill and Boulder Junction. So the largest sample size for downtown here. Um, I just want to acknowledge that this data might look, it does look a little bit different from the tab memo. Um, so apologize for that as we worked through the, the data, but wanted to, to present the, the latest and greatest data here. So you can see that folks uh, were able to slide um, their responses as to whether they wanted to see a lot more of a curb use where they would rank something a five or a lot less of a curb use where they'd rank something a one. Um, so with the legend on the left, we can see that private vehicle parking ranked the lowest. Responses wanted to see less private vehicle parking than they did any other curb use. Um, so just to acknowledge three is this baseline of no change. So it really is coming um, about between some less private vehicle parking and no change on the private vehicle parking. So even though parking is um, the curb use that folks wanted to see less of, it's it still is uh, pretty close to, to no change. Um, and then next was car share, hearing some of the open-ended qualitative feedback. That's because uh, there's car share parking in, in uh, garages and off-street structures, um, and then parklets. So we'll talk about this in the open-ended comments as well, but mixed um, responses on, on parklets and some street closures in downtown and University Hill as well. And then on the upper end, things that people wanted to see more of, bike and scooter parking ranked the highest here, um, just at about some more bike and scooter parking. Um, and responses and, and feedback we heard on this was that when possible, bike and scooter parking should be on the sidewalk. However, often this gets in the way of the, the public right of way and pedestrian movement. And in those cases where there isn't enough sidewalk space for pedestrians, as well as bike and scooter parking, the curb space can be used uh, for micro mobility parking. Short-term curbside pickup also ranked highly. So, so folks will remember the blue temporary signs that came up with COVID uh, with 15 minute curbside pickup and drop off. So something similar to that in response to, to Chris's comment on the evolution of demand for, for curb space. Um, safer crossing also uh, in the top three as we think about bulb outs and the trade-off of that space for uses of the curb as well. Carly, before you leave this slide. yeah. Are, are all of these options, were they selected from a pull down menu or do some of these it represent fill in the blank, you know, free form responses? Of, that's a great question. All of these came from a pull down menu. You could okay, select to, to leave no comment on one of Thank these. Thank you. So then on the next slide, we talk about some of the, the, the general themes we heard. And these came from a lot of the, the um, bullets of, of who we engaged throughout this process that Liv mentioned. So the focus groups, um, as well as access allies, and then from the open-ended comments that were available in the questionnaire as well. So with almost 300 respondents to the questionnaire, we got a lot of feedback on um, generally what uses people want to see more of or less of in the community. So some of the, the themes that we pulled out from those is a desire for the curb to, to better reflect city goals. And the city goals that really stood out are sustainability, um, and, and promoting modes other than, than driving alone. So we'll see that in the breakdown of, of some of these more specific recommendations. But when people saw the amount of space being used for private vehicle parking, they felt like there was a, a need to reconcile that with, with the community goals for sustainability. And then as well as economic vitality. So a need for higher turnover spaces to really help support businesses, especially in, in the downtown area. Um, so as, as I mentioned in the chart, as we saw in the data, desire for more bike and scooter parking, 
Um, and then other uses that rose to the top that that respondents and, and stakeholders wanted to see more of are EV charging stations, outdoor dining, as well as in trees, greenery, and art opportunities to really enhance the placemaking of the curb um, and, and activate a space to, to make it feel safer um, as well as more, more lively. And then other potential opportunities are increasing are increasing spaces for uh, transportation network company like Uber and Lyft or private vehicle um, pick up and drop off locations. So we're seeing through observations as well as through feedback from others that Ubers, Lyfts and private vehicles are dropping passengers off in travel lanes, they're double parking, they're in bike lanes, and this is causing obviously safety concerns as well as congestion. Similar behaviors that are happening for curbside pickup I'm just running in to pick up, but take up dinner, take out dinner, it'll take five minutes. So illegal parking, non-compliance and some safety and um, inefficiency implications of that behavior. And then more ADA accessible parking for, for those with mobility challenges as well. So we have another slide of, of some more open-ended comments. Um, we heard that, you know, as much as we want to see these other uses, it is important to have available on-street parking. Um, we heard this a lot from the business focus group as well and making sure it's really intuitive where that parking is um, so that their customers can, can conveniently find it and we can reduce cruising for parking, people circling the block, looking for an available on-street parking space. But at the same time, needing to balance that with mode shift goals of if parking becomes easy and accessible, then it, it provides less incentive for people to walk, bike, or take transit. So understanding the trade-offs in, in that space. Um, Off-street parking garages and, and uh, surface lots also is an important part of the conversation and has come up a lot in the feedback. So that are um, utilizing parking garages uh, by providing wayfinding and information to direct people to parking garages, as well as it came up improving the personal safety of garages that that might be a barrier to using garages as well. So better understanding what are the barriers to using off-street um, parking and, and how can this effort help, help address those better leverage on street spaces. And then it's temporary street closures. So, so parklets or event um, blocks that had mixed responses um, in through the feedback. So we heard from, from some folks um, that they really enjoy these spaces. Others uh, wanted to see improvements or maybe making them temporary, saw success of them in the summer, but less so in the winter. Um, and improvements being to make them more intuitive, consistent between businesses, provide better pedestrian access, uh, items like that. And then lastly, referring back to Chris's point on how the curb has evolved, um, respondents and, and stakeholders that were engaged acknowledged that the curb should better represent our, our current demands, um, as well as embrace and uh, incorporate changes in technologies as well. Um, so moving from community engagement to existing conditions. So part of the existing conditions is understanding this qualitative feedback of what are the challenges to the curb today? How is the curb currently being used? So we took this qualitative feedback and supplementing it with uh, a comprehensive data collection effort. So we inventoried every curb space within each of the three zones that live shared. We also looked at alleys. How are those being used for loading, for parking, um, or for moving people as well? And then we also collect parking occupancy during what we determined to be the peak parking time for each of these three areas by using smarting data to identify that peak parking time and then collecting updated uh, parking utilization data that I'll share as well. We also just made observations acknowledging that a lot couldn't be captured just with this one snapshot in time of data collection. So went out um, to each of these three areas multiple times to observe how the curve was actually being used and capture some, some latent demand and non-compliance as well. Then we reviewed Boulder Revised Code to understand what current policies and regulations are as it relates to the curb today. Um, this creates an important foundation as we look to, to making modifications and exploring options to, for policies and programs as well. And then lastly, looking at what is the city's current process in responding to requests to changes to the curb? So an example is a business requests a parklet outside of that business. What is the, the process for city staff to respond to that request? So to share a snapshot of, of the data that we collected, this is showing, I'll show each of the three 
zones, um, both a map and a pie chart of what is the breakdown of curb regulations in each of those zones. So you can see in this map, it's obviously downtown. Um, the majority of downtown is parking. Most of that is paid parking. However, there, there are a few blocks and spaces kind of on the outskirts of downtown that are either unrestricted time-wise and or um, free for users. Um, and then we also, in the mostly orange, you can see our alleys. So a, a significant amount of loading um, is, is allowed in those alleys. We also have a small amount of the curb space used for parklets, um, as well as bus stops and um, EV parking as well. That majority is, is used for private vehicle parking in the downtown. And in Boulder Junction, we see a few corridors where vehicle parking is paid and time restricted. However, a number of, of local roads where we have the pink, which is free unrestricted parking as well in some of the more residential parts of, of Boulder Junction. Um, a few bus stops and a few loading zones as well, but primarily using the curb space for private vehicle parking. When we break that down, there's a few EV spaces that, that folks might be familiar with um, as well. And then lastly, University Hill. So um, similar to Boulder Junction, you know, 13th Pennsylvania College, a few, a few corridors where we have paid and time limited parking, but then as you go kind of further from campus, parking um, is free and um, unrestricted time-wise, and then using a few of the alleys for, for loading as well. Um, so you can see the breakdown in the pie chart here that we, we have a higher percent of curb space in University Hill than, than others other zones for loading, whether it be people or goods. Um, and then as well, because of, of the parklet at 6% used for, for, parklet, for the street closure. And then parking occupancy. So we um, collected parking counts in September of 2021. Um, when we compare this historically, the parking occupancy is higher than it was in 2020 during kind of the first year of COVID, but it is lower than pre-COVID data. So kind of understanding the context and the evolution of demand for parking is really important. Uh, but you can see here, so the, the blue, um, so we've got polygons for off-street parking and lines for on-street parking. Anything coded as blue has between zero and 60% occupancy, and then TL60 to about 75, uh, 75 to 85 is yellow, and then anything over 85% um, is, is shown in red here. So although we expect that parking demand will continue to, to go up as uh, folks are, are commuting more and, and going back to work more, we, we do not anticipate that parking demand will increase to what it was in, in pre-COVID levels. Um, but this is definitely something that we want to understand more and take the time to really compare uh, pre-COVID data and, and do a little bit more analysis on. Uh, but we are seeing from this data that, that we do have additional capacity and there's flexibility to reallocate where vehicles are being parked. Um, so in line with, with some of the backgrounds that we just provided on AMPS and, and the goal of these efforts, we see this as a really great opportunity to change behavior and, and introduce changes to the curb um, that are in line with, with city goals and have this project kind of lend support to how we, we rethink about access and, and mobility. Um, and then this kind of builds off of the, the previous conversation about CAN, appreciated the thoughts on pilots. Um, so as a part of this effort, as Liv mentioned, uh, we will be implementing pilot projects. This is a really great opportunity to collect before and after data and test out some of our recommendations and inform our longer term recommendations. So based off of the feedback that we heard through community and stakeholder outreach, we've identif identified two potential pilot ideas at this point. Um, the first is a TNC staging area. So this is a, a space designated for Ubers and Lyfts um, to wait either for a request from a passenger or a place where passengers can go to pick up their Uber and Lyft. Um, this addresses the concern that we heard about safety um, and, and passengers looking for their Ubers and Lyfts, um, pick up and drop offs happening in the travel lane people cru Ubers and Lyfts cruising to look for their passengers or to wait for another request. Um, so this is a, a platform that's been used successfully in Denver and across the country um, where there's a geofence created on the back end 
for these transportation network companies and provides a really clear connection for passengers uh, as well as Uber Lyft drivers to, to find each other in a much safer and, a, and more efficient uh, use of, of space for that as well. And then the next pilot idea, we're calling it Flex Zone. Um, so this space would be allow for the use of a number of different curb uses currently. So instead of just having a passenger pickup zone, a goods loading zone, or a 15 minute curbside pickup zone, we're combining those three uses into one space, acknowledging that the demand for those three uses might vary throughout the day. So this allows for a higher and better use of the curb um, and just more clarity instead of breaking down loading into passenger and goods loading. Um, you know, clumping that together increases the intuitiveness of how the curb can be used. Okay, thanks, Carly. Um, so just to wrap up before we open it up for uh, discussion, um, in terms of next steps, um, we have a few more stops uh, with uh, planning board and council over the next month or so. Um, we'll be uh, looking to potentially explore these pilot projects, identify, design them, and um, potentially influence, implement them, um, you know, really to learn about um, the impact of policy choices, and we would review any of those plans with you before implementing, um, and at, at the same time also starting to flesh out some of these options for our policies and for the program overall. So um, you may recall, these were our key questions for you in the memo, um, just to see if you have any additional feedback or questions um, about uh, what we heard through our community engagement effort um, and uh, regarding the existing conditions, you know, was there anything that jumped out at you um, uh, that we should really look at um, as we continue through this project process? Um, and just as a bonus, if you have any reflections on the, the pilot projects and the approach for that, um, that would be great to hear as well. So thank you so much. And I'll pause and uh, happy to hear from you. Thanks, Liv and Chris. And thank you for joining us tonight, Carly. I thought it was it was neat to see the priorities based on the, the community feedback, uh, supporting active modes of transportation scored well, and then so that the place making things were in the middle and on the upper end and the private vehicle parking was was on the, the lower end so I felt that that uh, reflected the the goals in our TMP and so I'm hopeful that the, the outcomes of this study reflect that as well does anyone else on tab have any questions or feedback for the curbside team Tila Thanks, Alex. I had a couple of thoughts in different areas here. Um, one, I was the reason I asked about the questionnaire results, or a, a thing that jumped out at me with the questionnaire results um, when I asked, are these preformed responses or, or not? Um, was it, it? It did seem like a lot of these uses were very subdivided in ways that I thought might be make more sense as bigger categories, which I think Carly hit on right at the end, um, talking about flex zones, and so. Um, I was looking at the slide that was saying, you know, do you want it to be a goods loading zone, scores slightly lower than a passenger loading zone, which both scored lower than short term curbside pickup. And I thought, you know, all of those things kind of function the same way for me if I'm also on the street trying to park my bike or, you know, use it, whatever. I don't really care whether that person is loading goods or loading a passenger or loading, you know, getting their food. As long as they move along within five minutes or so, it's all kind of the same to the clam. Um, and so I would I would encourage sort of that kind of broader chunking of of uses um, when you're thinking about flexible stuff. Bearing in mind some of it might happen at different times of day, but I'm I'm hesitant to say like this is a section for TNCs to operate versus this is a section where FedEx and UPS and private delivery companies operate. Um, but to try to like allocate sections of the of the curb space that that you know all all users and on very short term periods within 
pretty um, easily identifiable seg segments of the workday or work week would, would all reasonably want to be competing for the same small amount of space to allow them to kind of all share and let that be a bit of a, um, a salad bar for them, I suppose. Um, I think that the parking occupancy stuff is fascinating and I wish I had had more time to think about it and look at it because it's something that I've been asking for like since before Dom Nazi was on the board for those of you who are long, <laughs> long in the tooth enough to remember him. Um, but a few things jumped out at me on the parking occupancy slide for the downtown area and one of them um, was about 17th Street, which we talked about earlier as part of the PMP and that removing on-street parking was not feasible because of the needs for people in the area. Well, it looks like in one direction, in the northbound direction, it's pretty well occupied, but in the southbound direction, there's minimal occupancy, which tells me there's some, possibly some um, time of day data collection bias in here, that people who are coming into the area and just find something on the direction of travel that they happen to be in or parking, but just to see like red on one side of the street and blue on the other side of the street is telling me we're not effectively managing parking on those streets. I'm looking at 16th and 17th streets, both south of uh, Spruce or Pearl. Um, and then also what jumped out at me was 13th street or 14th street um, being heavily underutilized. And that's really good news, I think for, um, for the um, downtown station um, expansion because it says we do actually have room and it's a good place to put um, um, bus um, loading zones. But the next block over on 13th Street, we don't have data. And I'm curious about that one because that's been a long kind of thought target for making that a, um, a pedestrianized street um, because it's where, you know, the, the, if there's a park on one side, there's a couple of businesses that are fairly underutilized. The Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art is there. But they don't really use that much parking. And so I, I feel like this data might, might point to, it's not necessarily um, part of the scope of this project, but it might be to think again, have a really hard look at that block in particular between Arapaho and Canyon of 13th Street to become pedestrianized um, or at least to um, disincentivize on street parking. I think that the parking utilization there is probably quite low. And so I was curious why there wasn't any data on that one. Carly, I see you in no, Yeah, I'm not, I don't know offhand. I'd have to dig in into that. So Liv, if you've got an answer, you can go for it. Otherwise I can look into it. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll just, we'll check on that, yeah. There are some interesting boundaries that we were working within, but um, I, I'd like to I'd like to check on that. So okay. thanks for pointing that out. All right. My yeah. last question then was, you know, when Chris was talking about the project context and the interrelated goals of Vision Zero, and VMT reduction, and greenhouse gas reduction, of mode shift, those are definitely things that Tab keeps trying to highlight. Um, and then when you talk about what the purpose, the objectives of the curbs, curbside management is, um, none of those things are making it into the objectives of this project. Equity curbs for people, customized for a variety of needs, easy to use and understand, decision-making clarity. Possibly it goes into decision-making if we're talking about mode shift, but I, I would definitely like to see, and I think we've talked about this before, um, Something more than just give me your ideas, but um, give me your ideas, access allies for achieving these particular goals. Not what would you like to see more or less of, but in what ways would you like to change how we use XYZ block, XYZ something in front of your business to better achieve our greenhouse gas goals or our mode shift goals. Um, I, I talked a little bit about that before. Um, and what was the last thought on that one? Mode shift, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I, um, you know, Liv, I really respect the work that you do in thinking ahead and giving people homework and giving people things to think about. Um, but I wish that you would be able to constrain the thoughts um, more about what, what you in particular want as respondent here on this survey or on these questions, as opposed to how can you help us sort of um, 
crowdsource a, a solution to a common problem, to highlight a couple of things to achieve through this, as opposed to just throwing spaghetti against the wall and seeing what's the most popular idea, because I do think that we have a responsibility to be, um, you know, redirecting people's vision and, and um, priorities towards BMT reduction, greenhouse gas reduction, mode shift, that kind of thing. So I, I just wanted to highlight that again. I wasn't able to make it to the last Access Allies meeting. I don't know how much you guys talked about it, um, but again, it just feels very open-ended and you know, what, what is everyone's idea is not necessarily the thing that we should be um, grasping for. We should be asking for ideas toward a, a particular defined objective. And we have enough information in existing city plans to have some outlines for those objectives. That's all, thank you. Thanks, Tila. Anyone else from TAB have any questions? Let's see, Ryan's unmuted. Alex, just real quick. I attended the meeting last week, so I did the deep dive, so I'll, I'll spare any detailed comments now, um, but just wanted to say mainly live thanks to you and the team. Um, I thought you did a nice, nice job. Um, and maybe I'll just say two things that, that we talked about then. So first on this, on the question for TAB, um, so, oh, do you have any additional feedback or questions on the community engagement key findings? I thought it was interesting that I don't think I don't know if I saw the graphic today actually, but there was um, a, a slight maybe a slight difference uh, in in um, in what maybe uh, d desired state from from the uh, from business owners versus employees, and that business owners were a little more vehicle motor vehicle centric. And I just thought it was sort of an interesting um, uh, aspect. And I could hypothesize and I actually had a follow-up call with Rich, one of the, the folks to, to understand that better. So um, in any case, the um, the larger number of employees seem to be more in the camp of the motor vehicle parking wasn't that big of an idea, but this is also something that, that through TVM policies, we can um, educate uh, employers about not maybe not needing um, to be so reliant on motor vehicles. So it's just a reflection on the, for your question, number one. Um, and then the second one is just, um, I think that it, that the nexus of, of e-bikes as car replacements has a, has a, an important place in this whole discussion with curb space. Um, and I think one of them is better at understanding how can e-bikes be de delivery vehicles for, for businesses doing delivery and getting, getting to know the, 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 business, the local business case better and trying to figure out other ways we can um, better encourage, you know, give, give, give incentives for, for e-bikes to do that to, to business owners. And then conversely, uh, to the extent we're doing uh, bike sharing, e-bike sharing, e-bike rentals in the city, if we can start to provide cargo bikes in like larger format or bikes that have greater utility um, to get butts and seats, so to speak, and use the curb space as a way to make that accessible or I should say visible, um, we're going to start to see the public trying these things and realize the magic of going shopping in an e-bike and, um, you know, being being evangelist. So um, I'm just being redundant with what I said last week, but wanted to share that for this option here. Thanks for your great work. Thanks. Thanks, thanks. Can I just hop in real quick on that? Sure. Uh, Brian, thanks for putting meat on the bones. And I think that's partly what I was trying to say about, like, using curbside management to advance particular goals, but to actually make it easier and more desirable and preferable to use particular devices, other modes of transit, that, that's a really great example of how we might actually do it to, to, to advance mode shift. Um, that, so thanks for that. That was, that was a better way to say it than I did. Thanks, Tila. Trini? Oh, no, I was just, <laughs> after all that, I was just gonna add that I was really, really excited to see more bike, um, Bike and bike and scooter parking. I think that that's a a huge um, plus, and that it's needed, and it will go hand in hand with what Tila and Ryan are saying. You know, I mean, the more vehicle, well, the more um, mobility alternate mobility that we see out there, the more need we will have to have a place to park them. You know, <laughs> so yeah. Absolutely. Anything else from Tab, Becky? 
Yeah, I just have a couple quick things. One, I, I was I was interested also in the parking data, just the, the, the relatively low utilization of some of the parking garages was pretty interesting for a space that's, you know, part of the city that's pretty, pretty valuable. So um, just interesting to see, so I appreciate that data. Um, I, I just have a question about these two pilot ideas. Um, I understand why they, the value of the, of these two, I guess I'm wondering why, like how you got to these two relative to the other ideas in the list, like what, like why these two and not others or yeah, what popped these kind of bubbled these up to the surface. Yeah, I can kick that off and then invite other team members to add because we did brainstorm several projects and it was kind of marrying some of the existing issues that we knew we wanted to address like safety, congestion, et cetera, um, and um, not having enough um, loading zones and things like that. And looking at some of the pilots that were done in other cities and getting ideas there. And again, kind of looking for that marriage and also something that we think that we can implement fairly quickly in a pilot project form to be able to um, experience and evaluate and learn from uh, to support this effort. Um, so we started with a, a longer list and um, have have ended up with with these two kind of through that process. And I don't know if Carly and Chris or anyone want to add to that, but. Uh, hi, Chris Haglin here. I, I just add that um, in our stakeholder conversations, you know, these two in particular came to the forefront from our stakeholders. Um, I think the TNC pickup and drop off is is important. I think a lot of people see a lot of unsafe behavior occurring with with that type of pickup and drop off. Not only unsafe behavior, but also behavior that backs up traffic and causes travel delay. Uh, but the safety impact is was really a key thing. Uh, and then I think you know the way in which we've been adapting to COVID and the way in which people are accessing goods and and picking up uh, products, um, the need for additional loading zones and, and the flexibility of those loading zones came to the forefront in our discussion with a lot of the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And I think building off Valerie's points back in McCann conversation is behavior change takes a really long time. And so a, a lot of the great ideas that would be wonderful pilots, we would need a full year of implementation of that pilot to, to really see the, the impacts of it. And so thinking of what pilots could we over just a few months begin to see the safety improvements, change of travel behavior, um, these ones really rose to the top and, and what's feasible from, from a quick implementation standpoint and also seeking city staff feedback from maybe maintenance and available resources um, on the maintenance side was an important consideration. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's helpful. So this, this can be done relatively, relatively quickly. And then I imagine like since you collected a lot of this feedback, could that be used then for future phases to address some of the other top priorities that came out of the feedback, but aren't going to be you know, part of this pilot? Is that sort of, is that the is that the thinking like with I mean by posing for instance like offering that people could select these other options from this like list of things and things they highlighted like those are things that we might pursue later on based on this feedback. Yeah, exactly. So the pilot projects are just a subset of some of the potential changes that would be part of the overall program. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anything else from Tab? Not seeing anything. Well, thank you, Chris, Liv, and Carly. Looking forward to seeing how this, uh, this plan progresses. Thank you for your time. And with that, I think we'll move on to matters. First, matters from staff, which I think we're going to kick off with a, an update on the Dr. Cog TIP program. I see Jean's here and unmuted. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Can you hear me? Great. Um, give me just a second to share my screen. Here we go. And let me see the slides.
Okay, great. Um, so, hello, Tab, and thanks for having me this evening. My name is Jean Sanson, and I'm a principal transportation planner with the city. And um, you've seen me several times on this topic um, over the last several months, but for the benefit of our new TAB members, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context before I jumped into our slides this evening. Um, so as you can see from the title, Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog is the region's metropolitan planning organization, and they are responsible for the preparation of what we call the Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP. And the TIP is the primary mechanism by which federal transportation funds flow to local governments like the city of Boulder. Um, the TIP selection process is typically conducted every four years or so, and the city has successfully submitted projects for funding since the program began in the 1990s. So for example, um, two of the projects that are currently under construction and are TIP funded would be the North Broadway Reconstruction Project and the um, Colorado and 30th Underpass Project. So this evening, I'm gonna be sharing progress we've made towards identifying, scoping, and costing potential project applications for this next cycle of projects. So our proposed TIP project list is, der is derived from the TMP and has been developed with quite a bit of guidance um, from TAB. And what we've done is identified and prioritized projects for um, the upcoming two TIP cycles that are intended to advance the TMP as well as be competitive in terms of the Dr. Cog TIP application scoring criteria, as you see on this slide. And in addition to projects that are in support of Dr. Cog's Metro Vision Plan and advance improvements to the core arterial network and our regional, trans our regional transit corridors, um, we are looking at projects that, that holistically advance the goals of the TMP, as you see on the right, that they are, they are creating a system that is safe, equitable, provide travel choices, and support clean air and our climate commitment. So at a glance, here is a map of the seven proposed TIP projects that we would like to advance. Um, and now I'm going to briefly walk through the general scope and funding for each of these projects, as well as share feedback we just received this afternoon from the Dr. Cog Boulder County Sub-Regional Forum Staff Committee. And I know that that is a mouthful, um, but we did just have a very successful meeting with them. And I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Ryan and Alex for attending that meeting. So starting with the projects we'd like to submit for fiscal years 2022 through 2025, um, the 30th Street Preliminary Design Project proposes to conduct preliminary and final design for protected bicycle facilities and transit stop improvements on, on, on 30th Street. Um, between Arapahoe and Iris or, or the diagonal Colorado 119. Um, the project will develop and evaluate conceptual transportation design options to improve multimodal, including pedestrian, bicycle, transit, and vehicle travel along 30th, and will include preliminary engineering and cost estimates for these transportation improvements. And I'm happy to share that this project was very well received from um, the Dr. Cog Boulder County Sub-Regional Forum uh, staff committee this afternoon, and particularly the strength of the multimodal components of the projects. And um, committee members offered that they think this will be a competitive project for funding. Um, you know, one of the questions that we were asked in this afternoon's meeting was about the design options that are under consideration and the criteria that we would use to evaluate those options. And as you all know, our response to that type of question is that that's exactly what we'll be addressing once the project commences. Um, here's a project, the Colorado 93 are Broadway and Table Mesa and Broadway and Regent Transit Priority Intersections that I'd like to provide an update on because um, we've pivoted a bit on this application. So when you last saw um, our proposal, we were looking at a design only TIP application, but we're now looking at a design and construction project based on information we recently received from CEDA. Um, I think Valerie alluded to that earlier. Um, so just a little bit of context, CDOT is updating their 10-year plan. Um, it won't be fully adopted until probably July of this year, but early indications from CDOT are that as per the City of Boulder's request, 
um, they will likely be programming $1.5 million to fund design of these inter intersection improvements as early as 2023. So that's, that, that's potentially really good news. Um, so with our TIP application, application, we would hope to use these CDOT pre-construction funds and limited local, local funds as a match to the Dr. Cog TIP funds to fully design and construct the project. Um, the scope itself includes intersection improvements to provide transit priority at these intersections and an analysis of general purpose lane conversions to business access travel transit lanes between Table Mesa and 18th Street with lane restriping and signage as feasible. So if this TIP application is successful, we would begin design in 2023 and potentially construction as soon as 2025. Our next project is the US 36 or 28th Street West Side multi-use path between Four Mile Canyon Creek Bridge and Violet. What's really exciting about this project is that it would complete the entire extent of the 28th Street multi-use path from the south end of the city to the north end. It would construct a 10 foot wide bi-directional concrete multi-use path for bicyclists and pedestrians on the west side of 36. Um, and it'll likely include installation of storm sewer improvements, signage, wayfinding, and bicycle parking. And I'm going to pause because Tila, I see that your hand is up. Am I misremembering? Was this project not four and a half million last time we talked about it? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, Tila, several, um, well, I shouldn't say several, a few of these projects um, have, um, we have increased the cost estimates for these projects based on more um, refined um, information. And I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Gary before I stumble <laughs> That's over. That's almost myself. double. That's almost it double. It is almost double. <laughs> it is almost double. And before I stumble over this, I'm gonna hand this question <laughs> over to Garrett. Yes. Uh, so thanks for the comment, Tila. And uh, you're right, this project did go up substantially. We uh, took another pass through and uh, recognized that uh, some of the uh, cost assumptions, and I'll, I'll just, uh, before I get into the specifics of this individual project cost estimate, it's not unusual for our cost estimates to move around a bit as we look at the scope and we take a closer look at the details of the elements that uh, comprise a cost estimate. And so some of the, um, the elements that were in the prior cost estimate had um, some outdated uh, assumptions and also had some outdated uh, unit cost numbers. And uh, so we went back and we actually did quantity takeoffs, which is, uh, I guess, a term for, we actually went in and, and measured specific lengths and dimensions on some of the key elements that had not been previously uh, measured. There, there were some just some general sort of um, rule of thumb estimate placeholders that had been put in the prior estimate. So this is a, a more representative cost. And um, I think, uh, I, I don't wanna take away from what, what Jean will say, but we heard feedback today that that's probably a, a pretty large ask of, of the tip uh, in terms of the overall um, uh, pool of funds that's available. And um, was asked, we were questioned about the possibility of scaling this. And that's something we can certainly do. We could look at doing a project that goes to J uh, and uh, and stops there. And um, in fact, that segment might actually be more affordable. The part of uh, the, the reason this project is, is costly uh, beyond just the cost of concrete multi-use path is that there's substantial drainage improvements. If you've mm -hmm. uh, driven or biked along that stretch, you know there's a substantial drainage ditch in, uh, yep. on the west side that we would need to put into a culvert and storm sewer system. And there's also some elevation challenges topographically that we need to construct some retaining walls. That stretch going up to J um, might be uh, a little uh, more conducive to the budget situation than the stretch uh, going north of there, so. Okay, so help me out. When you say up to J or down to J or like from where to where? I'm sorry, so uh, the image you're, is- You're reconsidering side. and you're thinking maybe X something to J is better. What's Right. So, and that's not definitive. That's, uh, we, we just got that feedback this afternoon, but uh, uh, so that, that's one possibility. So uh, the, the image you see on the left side, those are the, the stone uh, art pieces right at the crossing at Four Mile Canyon Creek. Uh, about 100 feet north of these stones is where the multi-use path merges into the southbound shoulder. And so it would okay. pick up from right here and go up to J as a potential next phase of work. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Garrett. Um, you know, I have I have nothing else to add. <laughs> That's exactly right. I think stay tuned. We will likely be be scaling this project just based on unlimited project funds for the region. Next project, um, as Garrett previously covered much of this, um, is the baseline enhanced transit stops and protected bike lane projects between 30th and Foothills Parkway. Um, this project will construct multimodal enhancements to the baseline corridor and would include um, a protected bike lane, floating bus stops, potentially bus stop consolidation, and intersection improvements. And I'm also happy to report out that this project was also um, successful or, or was well received by the Dr. Cog Subregion Staff Committee um, this afternoon, particularly the multimodal components and connections um, to communities further east along baseline. So, um, so thanks to Alex for, for bringing this up and elevating it to a, an application. And uh, we look forward to moving it forward and coordinating um, with the PMP work. Um, this okay. So I'm actually going to switch gears now to the longer range projects. I'd mentioned that there were there, there were two calls for projects. Um, this next call would be for for the outer years, and I'm going to describe the three projects that project applications that we're proposing to submit. So the West Colorado Avenue multimodal improvement project between Region and Folsom is is really neat because it's going to complete the western segment of the Colorado corridor project with protected bike lanes, transit lanes, and a consolidated transit stop, similar to the transit stops like at Broadway and Euclid that you would see for the Flatiron Flyer um, adjacent to, to main campus. Um, the project will build out um, the multimodal complete street cross section of Colorado Avenue um, as it was defined in the corridor study. Um, and what's really neat is that it also continues the work that's currently underway at 28th in Colorado and 30th in Colorado to provide a uniform travel experience um, to the intersection with Folsom. Next is the Colorado 7 or Arapaho and 30th Street multimodal intersection project. And this project proposes to construct raised protected bicycle lanes and wider sidewalks along 30th Street and a protected intersection where the pedestrians, the bicyclists and vehicle facilities have designated and separate spaces from each other. Um, the intersection improvements will be designed to accommodate the future conversion of outside general purpose lanes on Arapahoe to business access travel transit lanes um, with the implementation of the Colorado 7 BRT. And just as a reminder, this project um, will be get, we'll begin preliminary design of this project this year. And these tip dollars would help us advance project, this project into construction. And last but not least, this project will, the Colorado 7 or Arapahoe Avenue bridge replacement over, over Boulder Creek would reconstruct the bridge over Boulder Creek, replacing two existing twin bridges. The existing westbound bridge was, construct, was constructed in 1938 and it's structurally deficient. And the eastbound bridge was constructed in 1966. Um, what this project gives us the opportunity to do is replace those twin bridges with a single span bridge that would safely carry the almost 30,000 vehicles a day that cross it, as well as the pedestrian and bicycle facilities along both sides of the bridge and connections to the Boulder Creek multi-use path as envisioned in the East Arapahoe Transportation Plan. Um, it would also accommodate the conversion of outside lanes to business access transit um, with the implementation of Colorado 7 um, BRT. So those are our seven projects in a nutshell. So next steps, um, as I mentioned, we received some project feedback from the Dr. Cog Subregional Staff Committee this afternoon. Um, that was just verbal feedback in a meeting, but they also, staff members also had the opportunity to provide written feedback, which we hope to receive in the coming days to also inform how to refine or fine tune these project applications. And then as importantly will be our community engagement moving forward. So um, beginning rather soon, we are developing a Be Heard Boulder questionnaire um, project videos. It's pretty neat. Nathan Pope, um, who you heard from earlier on our staff, is creating um, little short two-minute videos that describe each of the projects. So like 
replacing what we would think of as a traditional open house where you would have boards in a meeting room and people could visit the various boards or projects that they're interested in. They can click on a video, learn about a project and ask questions and provide feedback to us. We're also gonna be offering um, staff office hours um, throughout this period for people to, to meet with us one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so with that engagement and the feedback that we receive, we will come back to TAB next month with a recommendation and public hearing, uh, moving into a city council endorsement in mid-May. So that's all I had for a presentation. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thanks, Jean Garrett. I think my first question is about in May, will we be providing a recommendation just for the first call for projects or will we regroup after that and then have another collaborative process where we provide feedback and then we have another hearing later in the year for the, the, the later call for projects? Yeah, that's it, it's our intent that we bring forward both calls for projects at one time just to minimize the amount of um, back and forth um, that we would that we'd need to do between now and December. So that's our intent. Um, but I would just I would also caveat that with this could be very fluid because we may end up in a situation where a call to project does not get funded and we determine that it might be more appropriate for a call for project or is still appropriate and we wanna move forward. So um, while we wouldn't have another public hearing per se, I do think that there are more conversations to be had through these processes with TAB. Okay, as someone who's had a bit of exposure to this, it, it feels like the, the first call projects alone are a lot to digest and discuss. And I think I would have a preference that we provide a formal recommendation in May for the first call and then commence the second effort to work out what the, the second um, submittal at the end of the year will be. Thank you for that. And uh, so Ryan and I crashed the party at the county today and I think it, I think it was a, a success and we heard some, some good feedback. I think Garrett and Jean, one, one thought from, from me was, it, it felt like some of the, the competitors in the county and the other jurisdictions, uh, they relied upon the visuals that were included in their abstracts and came with some, some talking points. And at times it felt like we were lacking a little bit on ex drumming up excitement or explaining the purpose of these projects. Uh, baseline, for example, we were, we were told by one person that it was, they thought that it would score competitively. Another said it was really cool. It felt like our competition was more excited about the project than we were. Uh, we mentioned bike improvements. We mentioned transit improvements. They were pointing out the, the reduction in conflicts between transit and bikes and citing personal experience doing stuff like that. But we struggled to remember what bus operated on baseline they were talking about the regional nature of the bus and how the stop consolidation could help improve transit recommendations. And I think they some of the other good feedback that maybe you alluded to was it ties into the, the countywide bike and transit network. And then it was uh, cool to hear that the county is thinking about doing a regional bike study and this might help support their efforts to have a dedicated bikeway out to, to Louisville and, and Lafayette. And then with, with 30th, Again, we were just, one person told us very competitive application. Another person said great project. For us trying to communicate the why, we, were, we presented 30th as an important corridor. Every corridor is important. I think uh, Valerie did a great job earlier this evening, really making the case of the experience and um, highlighting the things that are on streets and why streets are important. And that um, bringing that sort of information when we're presenting either in the abstracts or in the, the presentations to our, our competition would be good to help. We have so limited, seems like we have limited opportunities to really explain what and why and, and having a, a little more polished um, materials would, would be helpful. And then yeah, it didn't seem like the, the 36 at the price point um, was as well received uh, there are also some questions about the, the crossing treatments that I think we would want to think through before we, we move forward on a project like that. And um, one person asked questions about tying that facility into the neighborhood. And our approach is to not actually have direct tie-ins, but 
uh, perhaps use Violet Avenue. And I think given how um, there aren't, there isn't a safe bikeway on Violet, there aren't even sidewalks on um, the majority of it. That's not a, I don't think that's a, a great strategy at this point in time, given the opportunities that the, that the other projects present. Ryan, do you have anything else to add from, from the meeting this morning, this afternoon? No, no, that's comprehensive. Thanks, Alex. Cool. So does, I'm curious if other TAB members have any feedback on the proposed or under consideration call number two projects, which are baseline 36, 30th, and then the, the Broadway transit improvements, which we, we didn't have time um, earlier today to get feedback from the, the committee. But um, I think those are the four that staff have flagged as the potential earlier uh, applications. Pilar? Well, you, I mean, you heard me flinch at the uh, multi-use path stuff, jumping up to eight and a half million dollars. And that was one of the two that I called out at last meeting, like, ah, uh, that's really what we go forward with. I don't feel it. Um, that's maybe the best use of our stuff. So I'm, I, you know, I, I await how that project evolves. Um, and I recognize staff has said it's going to evolve. Um, and I'm trying to imagine what the priority intersections is going to do. So I was kind of busy thinking like, where is that intersection? What does it look like now? I, I'm curious, and I haven't looked at the county stuff that Alex, that you sent to us earlier today. So, um, but again, to, to improve four intersections here for transit seems worthy, but uh, what I was focusing on is the, the call for at 30th and Arapahoe, but you're just asking on call two. So for me, I'm just kind of flinching at the cost on the multi-use path project there. Bearing in mind, I moved here partly because I love the multi-use paths. <laughs> I'm a big fan of them, but I'm really not sure this is this is worth going to die on that hill for. Agreed. Any other thoughts on the, so it feels like we could a little bit better define Broadway and what all that entails. I have a little trouble picturing. I, I sense a ton of opportunity. It seems like you've, you've teed up some, some funding partners and some stakeholders that also see that opportunity. I think when you come back in May, having a, a better description of what exactly things would look like on the ground um, would ensure that you get a lot of support on that project from us. Thanks for that. I just have a quick clarification question. Um, I, I think you said this, Jean, but I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So there's, I see these like pictures, these like diagrams that look like plans, but they say preliminary design. So I'm supposed to understand that that's just like a sample. That's not the actual preliminary design. That's correct. Right. They're, they're typically very conceptual planning level designs or pictures. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then if there's nothing else on the projects that have been identified as potential call two, I think it'd be good to talk about call four. And I believe those projects are the Arapaho Bridge over Boulder Creek, the Colorado Western segment adjacent to campus, as well as the, remind me the, oh, the 30th and, and Arapaho protected intersection. And I sense some confusion, perhaps needless confusion, at our, at our last meeting about the exact state of the bridge that we're considering for a TIP project over Boulder Creek. Uh, through this process, I've learned a lot. I've learned about um, bridge, um, what are they called? Uh, the ratings, sufficiency ratings. And as I've Understood from Garrett, bridges are scored from zero to 100, with 100 being good. Uh, once they're below 50, they start getting concerning, and it sounds like the state um, brings funding to the table when they're in the 30s and 40s. And from the plaque on the bridge, the, the West Round Bridge, which is on the north side of the street, obviously, 
the plaque says it was built in, in 38. From what I found online, the, the South Bridge, which carries the eastbound traffic, was built in 66, as you alluded to, but was perhaps reconstructed as, as recently as 1986. And it sounds like the westbound bridge has a sufficiency rating in the 30s. I think you've alluded telling us the score for the, the eastbound bridge. I'm curious if that's something you could share with us now. Uh, actually, uh, Alex, I, I think I might have misspoke at a prior meeting. The sufficiency rating on the westbound bridge is actually 50.9. Uh, the the CDOT, CDOT staff had uh, uh, conveyed to me verbally that it was in the 30s. And then when they uh, I asked them to give me the report, it's actually uh, 50. I don't know what the sufficiency rating is on the eastbound bridge, but uh, I'm sure it's much higher. I uh, suspect that we would not need to totally reconstruct that, that structure and that we would look to use as much of the existing um, uh, structure as possible and, uh, and add on to it. Okay, I found some online bridge reports from 2017. And according to this report, the westbound bridge had a sufficiency rating of 51.9. Does that, is that what you think you heard from CDOT? Yeah, I actually have the, the I have a copy of the, the westbound bridge inspection report. I believe they inspect them every two years. Uh, so I think I've got the one from uh, 2020 or 2019. I can send that to you. Okay, it, more importantly, we're, we're talking about in the context of a TIP project, the eastbound bridge. And I found a, a report from 2017 that showed a sufficiency rating there of 74.4, <laughs> which unless something seismic has happened, um, we were, we were left with the wrong impression after last month. Hearing from TAB members, the, some of the, the terms that were used were, um, let's see, this project will replace a structurally deficient bridge. We were talking about loss of life. We were talking about the fiduciary responsibility to avoid the loss of life. Um, how replacing this bridge would really be central to the TMP principles of providing a safe network. And hearing from a TAB member, they felt that we were replacing a deficient structure. Um, Erica was left under the impression that she had a responsibility to replace a deficient structure. Uh, and talking to a, another member of, of staff after the meeting, they were left with the impression that the eastbound bridge had a sufficiency rating in the 30s. That's right. And what is particularly concerning to me are, is the fact that some of the basic questions about this project that I've sent via email have gone unanswered. Like, remind me which bridge we're talking about. I've not gotten a response to a question as simple as that. And during the last meeting, Tila asked the question after we were told about loss of life, life and all this stuff, is the bridge deficient? And the response was very unclear. It, you dodged the question. I don't have the specifics on it. I don't know if Garrett does, but I can tell you that CDOT would not be putting any money to it if it wasn't at the top of the list for replacement, which is of course what CDOT is doing on the eastbound, the westbound direction, but you led us to believe that the eastbound bridge wasn't sufficient. And when you were asked about that, you didn't say anything. And you didn't volunteer this information at any point. You again went back and talked about the quote, bridge is over 80 years old, um, talking about the sufficiency rating in the thirties, it wouldn't be on CDOT's radar unless there were a serious problem here. And it wasn't until you were asked point blank, do the structures have different sufficiency ratings? And that's when we finally got a clear answer that no, the eastbound lanes, the Southern structure is in much better shape. And so it seems like many people understandably were left with the wrong impression of what TAB and city council would be asked to support in the form of a TIP project that addresses the Southern Bridge. And it seems it, it misled not only members of TAB, but, uh, but others on staff and something that, that could have been uh, 
when you finally pressed, you, you came clean, but at no point did you volunteer the, the relevant information. Erica? Um, so Alex, thank you for flagging that. I can't, I don't have any information in the here and now, but what I will do is follow up with staff and then circle back around with you. I think that um, trying to solve this in real time right now isn't productive for any of us, but um, I will talk with the team and find out what had happened. Thanks, Erica. That's, that's understandable. Um, I probably would have trusted staff on this if I hadn't been been misled before. And seeing the, the high price associated with this location, I, I went out and just looked at it for myself. And, and that that was the, the giveaway. Um, this is something that I, I've spoken about with with members of TAB, uh, members of the community. I've, I've flagged for some members of council and the city manager's mm -hmm. office. And so I, I would appreciate um, you letting us know what you find and, and we can we can follow up with those those groups as well. And uh, between the complications of this project, the, the potential opportunities to value engineer the intersection at Arapahoe and 30th, uh, I think it would be good to just get the, the call two projects squared away. And then we will have time to, to get to the bottom of what's going on on these projects and, and see if it would be worth trying to come up with some, some more cost-effective ones for, for actual problems. Alex, I just wanted to ask one more question on this this particular project that you flagged. And I, I, you know, in listening to Jean, I believe she said this project would allow us to replace both segments of the bridge with a single span. Does that indicate we're building it as a different something or other? <laughs> so let's let's say the westbound leg is deficient or weak or in need of repair, are you saying that we will get um, a stronger single bridge instead of two separate bridges out of this project? I'll, I'll let Garrett, looks like Garrett wants to respond. Yeah, thanks. Yes, uh, uh, I will uh, respect what uh, Erica conveyed, Alex, um, that uh, we'll, we'll follow up and, and get more information. But I, I did wanna say, um, uh, I, I think ultimately I need to do a better job communicating information. Uh, I, it does me no good to misrepresent or to uh, try to mislead you. I, 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 my full desire is to be as transparent in this as possible. I view all of you as my partner and I, I'm not trying to mislead anyone. So please understand that if I've miscommunicated something, that's my fault and I apologize for that. And I just wanna work with you um, to make sure we get these projects right. So I appreciate all this input and this feedback. Um, to answer your question, the, the thought was that, uh, it, that the, the, with the eastbound bridge being in better shape that we could replace the westbound and add on to it to make it a single bridge without, the, as you know today, there's an opening between the westbound and the eastbound bridges. So we would look to add into to just close that whole thing off and to make it a single structure over the, 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 the creek path. Okay, thanks, Garrett. Um, in light of the discussion tonight, I definitely support Alex's suggestion that we only deal with um, call two uh, and sort of table feedback on call four for now, if that's acceptable to staff, I don't know, but uh, I'm also feeling uncomfortable with proceeding with call four, particularly with two new board members who, you know, this is the first time they're looking at this and thinking about it. Um, it, it feels like because of our, you know, working um, to make things not fire drills, but to, to plan ahead that we have a little bit of time um, to be more thoughtful about call for if that's acceptable to staff, I would support that approach. Great, thank you for that. Thank you, Tila. Oh, my last question. Sorry, it wasn't done with the questions. <laughs> what costs $5 million for on-surface treatments at Arapahoe and 30th? We, I mean, we built, a, we built an underpass under Foothills Highway a couple of years ago for six and a half million. What's, what's 5 million for that? It's right-of-way acquisition. Okay, tell uh, me more. So the, the design that uh, we're basing our estimate from uh -huh. in the 30th corridor study, 
assumes um, uh, that we'll need right-of-way acquisition on the southeast quadrant, that there's, there's insufficient right-of-way to accommodate the protection that's presented in the corridor study. And so uh, we would need time and money to acquire the right-of-way to um, advance the design as it stands in that preliminary or in the corridor design. Okay. Is that um, the same for, would that be the same answer for, I'm curious about um, the region, the West Colorado um, between region and Folsom, because it's a really, I think it's about like a 10th of a mile um, it's, and it's about $3 million for that distance. So is that right of way or what is this, or what's the cost driver there? There, there would be right of way um, elements uh, as particularly at the intersection on the north side of uh, Regent and Colorado that we would need to um, incorporate into that project. Is that where a lot of the cost comes from or is it from other aspects of this? It, so right, right away is a substantial part of, of that cost, um, but then uh, we, we would need to, to move uh, some of the curb line potentially uh, uh, on segments that would also add to, to some of the costs on the project and then the uh, um, the transit stop uh, uh, amenities. We we had some assumptions in there about the amenities of what would go into that stop because we're thinking it would be something comparable to the Broadway Euclid stop on the southbound side of Broadway. Okay. okay. And move, when you say move the curb line, does that mean like widen? The curb, or widen the road, or which which way? Which way is the movement um, right. happening? But, yeah, moving the curb from where it is today to accommodate the raised protected bike lane. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Gary, back to the the thirtieth in Arapahoe. Do you have a sense of the five million? What share of that is capital, and what share of that would be the right of way acquisition? Uh, I don't have that right now, Alex, but I can get that to you. Okay, I, th I think that would be that'd be helpful. And as Ryan and I have discussed with you all, and I've started talking to some council members, uh, it, it seems like we could save a lot of space and reduce the footprint of that project if we were to forego the double left turn lanes for all of the approaches. And I, I'm sensing a lot of support of, we could spend 5 million here and do preserve auto capacity, not produce improve things all that much for walking, biking, and transit and nothing else, or we could improve things for walking and biking here and have a bunch of money left over to continue those improvements for our TMP priorities somewhere else. And so I would, I would just be prepared for a, a conversation, um, certainly with TAB and possibly with the community and council on, on the trade-offs that are inherent with, with that location in the right of way. All right, uh, one item I would add, Alex, is because it uh, intersects with State Highway 7, CDOT would also need to be a stakeholder that's a part of that conversation um, about what that would uh, look like in terms of intersection operation. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully uh, with all of the wonders that the Arapahoe BRT will provide, we won't need the, the double lefts from our, our walkable, bikeable 30th Street onto the regional BRT on Arapaho. Um, I think we, we can plan to keep things the same and we will keep seeing the same results or we can plan to succeed. And planning for success here looks like an intersection that only needs to move as many cars as our TMP goals aspire to move. And the byproduct product of that is additional funding that we can we can take and, and carry that momentum elsewhere in, in town. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd be prepared for that and appreciate whatever you can provide. Okay, any other tip feedback for tonight? If not, we will be having a public hearing about this at our meeting next month as staff alluded to. And then council, and I think these are these are due on the, the 26th of June and looking forward to see what we can we can accomplish with this. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does city staff have any other matters for tonight? Um, just one. Mm -hmm. and I feel compelled to, um, I guess, 
flag this and so forth. One of the things that um, we are as staff and then as direction um, by both council and the city manager is to um, bring forward and engage um, in with boards and commissions and um, in terms of racial discrimination, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of the things that um, we've been asked to bring before the board and hopefully at your um, retreat are the kinds of um, framing and, and behaviors that we um, would hope as a city to be able to demonstrate in terms of providing a welcoming and constructively engaging um, environment of civil discourse um, that respects all voices um, in the community and in the room. So I just wanted to flag that because this is relatively new information um, that came out this past Friday um, evening. So thank you. Thanks, Erica. That's something that uh, Tila and I have discussed incorporating into the retreat and certainly something that will carve out sufficient time. Um, so if you have an idea of how much how much time you'd like for that, please please let me know and we'll, we'll work together to get that in the agenda. Great, thank you. With that, we'll move to matters from the board. And the main thing I'm seeing on there is the tab retreat, which we have scheduled for two weeks from tonight, same time, same place. Uh, virtual format starting at 6 p.m. Uh, Erica, do you know if we'll have a facilitator for that? I've asked Brenda um, if she is able to be there and um, I'm waiting to hear back. I'll know um, more tomorrow and let you know. Okay, would appreciate that. And in recent days, Tila's put together uh, a, an agenda for the retreat. Um, and I'll, I'll just run through some of the things on there now and then would welcome any tab feedback uh, to get a sense of what all we want to do there. Um, the first thing would be uh, getting to know you activity and identifying some of our individual goals that we hope to work on in our tab capacity in the, in the coming year. Uh, then a review of all of the relevant sections of the city charter and work to either as a refresher or, or an introduction, uh, discuss the responsibilities and limitations of TAB members and the board. And then uh, review the letter that we sent to, the, the previous TAB sent to, to council at, for their uh, most recent council retreat. Um, Erica, we've, we've carved out some time for equity and the diversity framework and discussion, 30 minutes on there. Uh, let me know if you, you think you want more than that. I'd be happy to accommodate that. And then I don't know if you ran this by Erica, but we think it would be beneficial to hear from, from you all what, what, what's in the work plan uh, on your end. Uh, I think it's, it's helpful to know what you're, what you're working on so that we can support you and not go, go too far astray. And then after hearing that, we can then work to refine our individual goals and identify some that we, we're, we're all supportive of. So try to get down to a, a manageable number of goals that TAB can focus on that are then um, in alignment with, with what the city staff's working on so that we can try to be as supportive as possible. And then um, Tila has prepared some draft policies and procedures for, for the board. Uh, Tila, if that's something that you would like us to consider adopting, um, if you want to say something about it tonight or just send out the, the draft you have to, to board members and we can review them. Um, that's potentially. Sure. Yeah, so, so this came up sort of uh, after the last retreat um, and I and Erica and um, Natalie and the city attorney's office kind of worked. Um, some boards have policies and procedures, some do not. Um, apparently about 20 plus years ago, city attorney's office then drafted some working policies and procedures for TAB that were not adopted. So we, we played with those um, and, and fiddled with them a bit to sort of try to resolve some existing, then existing issues and possibly recurring issues um, about how, we, how TAB manages this agenda, um, introduces new topics outside of the um, the usual framework with with the director um, and our and our agenda setting meetings. 
Um, and we kind of had it as a, as a thing to think about for about three or four different tab meetings before I said, we're not getting anywhere in here. Let's just table it till the retreat. <laughs> so that's the, that's the background for that. But there has been, you know, some work by the, you know, by me and the deputy director, director and city attorney's office, all current staff um, to kind of finalize that stuff. So I'm happy to send that around as a, a you know, if, if we want to put that on the tab agenda. Um, you, Alex, have expressed uh, the opinion that maybe maybe we've worked past these issues and we don't need something formal. That's certainly a legitimate thing to do. And so that's absolutely um, a decision that tab can make. But uh, I was just trying to follow through on a um, commitment that we had made somewhere around July or August of last year saying, um, that this was something on the agenda, on our uh, radar, but that we weren't um, capable of picking up and handling in the course of a regular tab meeting, it would be more appropriate for the retreat. So that's that's the reason it would be on there now. Yeah, I appreciate all the work you've, you've done on that and the conversations that I've had. I think just the conversations have been somewhat productive. The, the next thing on the draft agenda is a discussion of ethics, candor, and transparency, which is something that I've suggested. And I think it I would find it beneficial to have a conversation about what I think are some of the uh, underlying causes of tension between TAB and staff. And, and if we could have a, a more frank conversation about that outside of a, a more formal meeting, at that point, I might be able to be more bought into policies and procedures. And I think we might be, even be able to, to refine those even further. Uh, so at the very least, I would, I'm gonna propose that we swap those things on the agenda. And um, perhaps at the end of, of that conversation, we can we can figure out how we want to proceed. If it's an immediate vote on if if get a sense of people if people support them or not, or, or if we want to continue to refine those. Sure. So um, to review a bit of getting to know one another, talking about priorities, the equity and diversity framework, hearing from staff what they're focused on figuring out how we can support those with a, a manageable number of objectives of our own, and then getting onto some of the more procedural um, matters that, that um, we've talked about in, in recent years. Um, is there, is, are there any other items that people are, would hope to get out of this or, or anything else you wanna get out of a treat? I feel like every treat looks a little different and I uh, don't know if any of them have been considered smashing successes. Uh, so we're, we're always uh, open to suggestions and, and new ideas and, and would, would welcome anything, including from especially the new members. I just wanted to chime in to say we, um, uh, I think at our last agenda setting meeting, Alex um, and staff, we talked about having a separate, you know, secondary meeting up coming up to the retreat. And so I, I expect that um, that you and Erica and Valerie and whoever else is going to be involved in the retreat and possibly Ryan are going to be, you know, hammering out the details of the um, the draft of the agenda. And so I just felt a responsibility to like pass that off to you <laughs> as the presumptive uh, oncoming chair. But I, I'll I'll leave it to you. I have nothing further to add, and I'm comfortable with wherever wherever it lands. I just wanted to give you something to work with but I'm perfectly comfortable handing it off to you and Ryan and Erica and Valerie and whoever else on staff needs to, to weigh in on it. I appreciate that. Without your work, I would have been very ill prepared tonight. So. <laughs> oh, just wait till the retreat comes, ha ha. <laughs> Brenda will take care of it. Okay, not, not seeing any any suggestions. So I'll, I'll work to, with Erica and, and hopefully we'll know who our facilitator is and we'll, we'll um, put together an agenda and we'll send that out well in advance so you all have a sense of what we'll be talking about in a couple of weeks. Um, now to open board comments for the new members. Um, this is where we often report back from any of the, the committees that were appointed to, which you'll, you'll likely um, end up on something like Access Allies, where Tila and Ryan go to additional meetings outside of our formal board meetings to meet with the, the curbside management, um, or we just share uh, general thoughts, questions, ideas, um, try to keep things relatively brief, especially as the hour of the day gets late. So um, Ryan, I think you mentioned that you had something for comment. 
Yeah, and I have the hardest time being brief when, when it's late, but it, it's anyway. Um, I, I do have something I'd like to, to say a few words on, uh, and it's it's the IPCC report uh, that came out last week uh, and the message that it has for us about transportation. Um, and transportation is a really important part of this body of work, and I, and I think we should have something about this on the record now. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to say a few words and um, we can leave it at that or, or come back to it, but um, I'll just proceed. So as, as folks might remember in 2019, city council declared a climate emergency. Uh, that was two years ago, three years ago. And IPCC gives us an update, which says that the problem has gotten worse. Uh, and it's even more important to be doing bold and brave things with and around transportation. Um, the document's a few thousand pages long, um, so you know I think very few people have looked at this thoroughly. Um, I, I've gone through it to some extent, and I've, I've got seven takeaways that I'd like to share. And um, you know, this is just me, but I thought um, to enter th something like this into the proceeding here would give us a chance for TAB staff or others to to correct or improve it, um, and give us a starting point for some of the things we might talk about at the retreat um, or onwards. Um, and so here I'll go, and this is, um, I'll find a few, I'll, I'll cite a few stats, but this is mostly just a paraphrase and using shorthand. Um, so this is, this is what does IPCC say on, uh, on transportation for us? Uh, seven findings. First finding, we're at the edge of a cliff and stepping back means transforming transformation. We have to reduce, uh, sorry, climate pollution has to peak by around 2025 and then rapidly decline. Transportation is one of the top four problem areas in terms of sectors. Finding number two, we, and this is, a, this is my paraphrase, uh, we, we're in a doom loop of car dependence, uh, which is making climate pollution worse. Uh, it's killing us and confronting the problem is essential for solving climate change. And if we do it, it will create abundance. Um, our transportation system is organized around car dependence as a result of self-reinforcing policy choices. Um, this is a condition that is multiplying the impacts of climate pollution from cars, um, and it is really hurting us in terms of health, equity, and affordability. Third finding, uh, the, head, the, the headline on what is most important to decarbonize around transportation is, is mobility, mobility and accessibility. Uh, IPCC, this, I think this might be a great quote, but cities can reduce their transport-related fuel consumption by around 25% by attending to mobility systems. Um, it's mostly a quote. Um, and specifically, uh, through compact land use and the provision of less car dependent transportation infrastructure. These are the, these are the strong forces. Um, but the thing is, we need to work, um, to, we, we need to apply uh, packages of policies together. There's no one single policy that does it. And many of the policies we do need um, are critical, but on their own, they don't, they don't say much. And I, I, I'm just, I'm thinking of, we had a, a we met, went to council last June, and um, there was some discussion about how parking by itself won't solve car dependence, and there was sort of like a therefore, let's move off of it. That's an example of, the, of, of, an, of, a, of a category of a policy that by, its, by itself won't fix the problem, but, it's, but it is, it is um, important for it. Um, okay, fourth finding, and I'll, I'll, I think I've done much more here. Um, a transportation electrification is necessary, but not sufficient to, to decarbonize transportation. Um, and we need electrification um, to accelerate in a way that's consistent with mode shifting. Um, electrification is happening the fastest in micromobility and public transit. Um, it's not happening fast enough with automobiles and automakers need to be held to speeding up. But even if with widespread EVs, avoiding urban sprawl is considered a necessary condition for decarbonizing. Finding six, uh, leadership by local governments is crucial. Cities are critical for climate action, um, in part because urban areas generate the majority of emissions. These emissions are rising, and the centers of local government is where we will get where we will get the the, um, the strongest action. Um, I'll just kind of scroll here through quickly. I'm almost done. Um, COVID-19, uh, one of the the bright spots in some ways, is that it demonstrated that. <clears throat> excuse me the transformative value of telecommuting um, and using a bike, bike and, um, and pedestrian infrastructure expansion. Um, and finally, on cities, cities have uniquely important tools for transportation, and we can't do transportation climate action without cities. Oh, sorry, this is the final, final thing on that. 
Um, we most importantly need a strategic change model. Um, we can't do city transportation climate action on a project by project or even a policy by policy basis, but we need a concerted and strategic package of policies aimed at um, tackling car dependence. And then the final thing, finding seven, is um, that this IPCC report for the first time has a section on demand and uh, social sciences are, are has been the last thing that IPCC has been able to make sense of, um, but in some ways it's the most important. And so you have a, a whole section talking about how we have not um, in the climate science arena understood what to do about demand, um, but there's now an acknowledgement in this body that um, we've got to get more focused on the produced products which are being produced in an excess causing climate pollution. And that is true nowhere, probably more so than the industry which is has two to four 10 cars that cost a large share of our incomes or park 90% of the time. Um, and when they are operating for local trips, which is more than half the time that they're operating, they're operating at 10 or 100 or 1,000 times <clears throat> multiple of energy use that you could get otherwise. So what we have is a system of engineered subsidized car dependence. Um, so thanks for, for bearing with. Um, but I thought it would be important to get that at least entered into our record that um, this is something that is uh, uh, the findings of our, of our climate scientists. And I think as far as going forward, um, one, I'm sure others have things to add to this and, and correct, probably, um, and would love to invite the opportunity for us to do that in the right forum. Um, and then secondly, um, to talk about how we can incorporate this into our work, both in terms of transportation related commitments that we're going to hold the city accountable to, um, and also with respect to pursuing policies and decisions that are based on the kinds of change models that IPCC says uh, are really important for transportation. So we can, I can just, I'm done. We can, if anybody wants to respond to any of that, um, fix anything I said they can, otherwise we can, um, we can move on. Thanks, Ryan. I always appreciate the perspective and, and insights that I'm not always exposed to elsewhere. Uh, you, you keep mentioning change model. And I think as we go into our retreat, we can sort of think of some of the overarching things that can become a part of the, the suite of strategies that we use within transportation. Um, to address the, the emergency we have before us. Do yeah. You have else to add? I, yeah, I also thought like this was a, a particularly timely, I mean, Ryan, I know you felt it went on long, but it was great um, and really timely um, and, and topical as we're trying to think of like, what are our big picture um, and long-term goals? Because um, as several of us have pointed out and uh, Rebecca in particular in her application to DAP pointed out, um, our goals are not attainable on, on, the, on the track that we're on. Our goals are either unrealistic or we have to make some real big changes. And that I think is something that the community is not hearing um, and, and needs to hear and, and to have it distilled really well that way through a, you know, an international panel of people who've been thinking about it for decades is, is a phenomenal place to start. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Any other matters from the board for tonight? Seeing no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, next is future agenda topics. Uh, in my experience, May, June, usually July are the, the busiest times of the year for us. Uh, it's when we uh, review and approve the, the CIP, which is transportation's budget, which is then passed on to council in the form of a recommendation that they work into the citywide budget. And, and that's time consuming. And then with um, the, the tip, discussions that are ongoing and usually there's only one tip cycle every few years this year we have two um, so between those two things uh, those those will likely eat up a lot of the next couple of months if, if anyone has any uh, future agenda topics you can share them Tila now or uh, or email them to Ryan and I and we can work them into the agenda when we meet with staff to set that Tila well, as you know, as I raised in uh, February and March, I think uh, I'm going to raise again now. Um, I, I do think there's value in having the police department come more frequently, and um, I, I still don't see it on the um, upcoming agenda. I recognize they're not going to have full details, but I think there's some value in having some more regular check-ins with our police department, particularly given sort of the flavor of public messaging I've seen around some of these critical and, um, you know, high injury or 
fatality crashes that we're seeing, I, I, I don't think they're really drinking the same Kool-Aid we are. Agreed. We'll, we'll keep that in mind when we set the agenda with staff and we'll, we'll work to get an understanding of what the changes at the, um, at the police department and how those might impact the, the communications or the, the presence that they have with us. But Terrific. Thank you. I agree with you. Uh, Alice, can I just put one plug in for um, winter snow and ice uh, maintenance? So, so this is probably the last month we're going to have until there's no snow to remind us um, that we that we talked about the um, idea of having a strategic session for TAB on how do we think about strategy and priorities for, for snow and ice removal? Um, what's getting left off and what would it take to do a more comprehensive job on like the residential bikeways or green streets to get that done on a more automatic basis or just to have a conversation about that? Um, in my opinion, uh, utilization of our bikeways and especially the multi-use pathways is totally falling off in the winter and it's happening because of this first last mile issue. Yes, there's political and budget considerations, uh, but I think this is exactly where TAB should be focused. So just want to put a last plug in here for the snow all melts um, that I'm very interested in us taking that on at some point before the next the next winter. Yeah, we can talk about that with staff. And I think typically they do an annual assessment of the previous winter. And so we'll get a sense of if that's already in the works and, and when that might be coming our way. But yeah, we can, can talk about that. If there are no other future agenda topics, I'll gladly entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I second. Cool, well, we'll see all of you in, in a couple of weeks and TAB members be, be thinking about what some of your priorities are um, for, for the year to come. And with that, we'll take a vote to adjourn. Welcome, new kids. <laughs> we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, thanks you. Alex. Congratulations. Thanks, Ryan. Congratulations. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, you guys. <laughs>